2 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The regular meeting is reconvened. Uh, Ms. Evans, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? Yes, there are people who have registered to provide public comment, and I will review the rules. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board, and I will keep track of time. We will be strictly following the time limit so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people. A person disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. Public participation will begin in person, or excuse me, will occur in person and virtually. We will begin public participation with the persons that are physically in the room with us today and then move to those in the queue online. Bless you. First person is Bonnie Wood. If you'll have a seat at the table. Oh, well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And whenever you're settled, well, you can begin your three minutes. Whenever I'm settled. Thank you. I'm Bonnie Wood from over Delta area, uh, right in front of the school board there. Um, didn't make it, but that's okay. You still have a voice outside, right? Uh, I'm here because as an educator, past educator, not back when they first had their first first book, textbook, which was what, the Bible, right? That's what they learned from. It was the first textbook we had. Then we have the Michigan Constitution. We have the United States Constitution. There was a plumb line. And I'm here to condole you because during this time, you have many more things taken the plumb line away from what we were told. According to the education, and when I was a teacher, I had to take a pledge to uphold the Michigan Constitution in the United States and the United States Constitution. It says here, encouragement of the education, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools, and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. <clears throat> Morality. When I was growing up, most of you were growing up, we did not have the stuff out there that our young kids have. Where is the basis? I'm looking at a state school board to stand on what a gender is. I, I thought it was kind of interesting because it says here, uh, legislature shall maintain and support a system of free public education in secondary schools as defined by the law. Every school district shall provide for the education of a pupil without discrimination of religion, creed, race, color, and national origin. Isn't it amazing there's nothing about gender? Because when you're born, you're born to be a male or a female. Now that man has come in to change different things because of what they think is right, you are feeling the pressure from parents and etc. to change and move the pendulum. I'm here to ask you to stick with what is right. And when you're looking at, when I was looking at this, I, as a grandparent, and an educator or Michigan State Board of Education Resolution in support of Michigan's LGBTQ. I don't know how many more we're going to have. What that said and how the vote went. And I just want to thank those who voted for a plumb line of what is right. Our children need guidance so that they do not be despaired as far as mental health and et cetera. So I just ask you to really consider what you're doing. Thank you for your three minutes. Okay. Thank you. But I do thank you for running and doing the things that you are doing. God bless you. All right. Next up is Annie Whitlock. Thank you. And when you're ready, you can go ahead and begin. 
Hello, my name is Annie Whitlock, and I am a social studies teacher educator at Grand Valley State University. Um, soon, in fact, right after this public comment, you'll be asked to vote on the social studies teacher preparation standards for middle school and high school. Uh, this is a document that I worked on with my colleagues across the state over several years, and I'm here to ask you to vote to approve these standards. Um, as you know, Michigan is facing massive teacher shortage and teacher preparation institutions across the state are feeling this as well. And we have been working to redesign programs, teacher preparation programs at all levels in all subjects, um, working to redesign them so that they're of high quality and create the best you know, teacher candidates that we can create, but also to be attractive for those who are thinking about entering the profession or aren't sure. Um, and so we believe that these standards put us in a really great position to create these excellent programs, and we cannot get started without their approval, and we're ready to do that. Um, so I would kindly ask that you vote to approve the standards um, after this um, so that we can get to work. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, <clears throat> Mr. Love. <clears throat> All right, sir, whenever you're ready. I've uncovered a massive ripoff of the school aid program in Michigan. Constitution, the out main Supreme Law says school aid fund shall be used exclusively for aid to schools. That's not what's happened. This book is the Illich District Detroit ripoff plan. And I'll give you the, the it took me a while to even read through this thing. Uh, they capture tax increments from state and local schools. They're taking money from the schools to give to this Illich Detroit arena deal. It violates the Constitution. Here's what the Constitution says. Here's data where the city is admitting they're taking school aid money. Here's the amounts that they're taking, and that's even worse. They're taking uh, $138 million from school operating, $28 from the, uh, 48 from the, the state, and then they're taking money from RISA, which is the uh, school system, the immediate school system for Wayne County, they're taking uh, uh, 35. This is what's going on. And it has to stop. You've all taken oaths to support the Constitution. That means stop this stuff. And here's one of the projects they got on the menu. Oh, the Fox Theater. It, they're taking money to redo the Fox Theater. It's a brownfield. Brownfields were for included uh, areas, not this. And it's right next to their new headquarters. So they're sucking money out of the school system to do this to the city of Detroit to make congested areas. And it's going through because the strategic fund says it's okay. They didn't even have the data when they had the, the open meeting and they didn't even follow the open meetings rule at the, the strategic fund. This is what's taking place. And how do I know this? Oh, I read about the papers? No. I went to the meetings, and it's so outrageous. On top of that, there were uh, the Detroit Life Building. They had the city council cancel it so they could put it back in again because they never finished it from the arena deal. And they were going to build an ice hotel next to the arena. They never built it. It's back in the deal, and we're going to get school aid money. You have the responsibility for education in Michigan. It should be stopped by your actions now. Not, well, we'll study it and look it over. Here's the documents. I'll get, leave it for you, and you can get it together. But if you don't do anything, you're part of the problem for Michigan. To let this happen is just outrageous, beyond even any kind of consideration. So please do your job. And now that you know about it, and here's the documentation, millions Millions, not just chicken feed, but there it is. Thank you for your public comment. Thank you for coming today. Who do I give this to? Give it to you? Yes, I can go ahead and take it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we will move to the people online. <clears throat>
please do your job. And now that you know about it, hello, can you hear me? Millions. Can you please millions, mute your YouTube? Yeah. Can you mute your YouTube in the back, please? Yes, I did. Thank you. If you would please state your name and where you're calling from, and then you can give your three minutes of public comment. Oh, okay. Abuju ani nishna a jawan anim tikle dishes nakash she can do them for the Kamas River in Donjaba. My name is Southern Thunder Woman. I'm Turtle Clan, and I reside in the Marshall Albion area, also known as Linda L. Cypher Chilburn. Uh, good afternoon, Superintendent Dr. Rice, President, and board members. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Judith Pritcha and uh, Elaine Cogen Lipton, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and others for their support back in March to review the Native American mascot resolution from 2003 and hopefully update a stronger one. As co founder of the Michigan Coalition Against Racism in Sports and Media, I'm very happy to report that on April 17th of 2023, the last Redskins school, uh, as we say our word here in the state of Michigan, Candon Frontier Public Schools, has voted to change their race-based mascot. In April of last year of 2022, Sandusky had voted to change, and then in November, they voted to become the Wolves. The Michigan Coalition Against Racism in Sports and Media would like to publicly say it is good to see these schools become trailblazers and to the future for all students, right along with other schools have, who have uh, completely changed. But according to our records, there is 32 high schools still using Native American imagery with other nicknames and logos like Calumet who has a religious sacred type in their logo but calls themselves the Copper Kings, or the Wyandotte Roosevelt High School, who are the Bears, but have a marching band that uses the Native American spiritual leader with a full headdress as their logo and call themselves the Chiefs. Uh, then you have schools like the Concha Indians in full swing with everything, and along with Marquette, who is phasing out, but yet call themselves the Redmen. With the largest total of schools being in uh, Wayne County with five and the neighboring counties of Oakland, Macomb, and St. Clair, there's one each, and that equals nine schools. Uh, right now we have Plymouth, Plymouth Canton uh, is looking into changing again, which is good, and uh, there's word uh, roaming around uh, that the Newberry Indians might be up for an approach uh, here in the near future. The Native American resolution um, that was requested to be looked at is very important to Native people here in Michigan because it will have effects on changes of schools to better the school environment um, for all students. And one way is that mascots travel outside their own school districts affecting other Native families and other communities. So they're carrying this um, race-based logo outside their own uh, communities. Our culture is our culture and shouldn't thank be used for profit. Thank you for your public comment. Okay, thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. If you could please state your name and where you're calling from, then you can provide your three minutes of public comment. I am uh, Salvador Lopez Pedro, and I'm calling from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm Salvador Lopez, uh, currently serving as an active duty component station at Grand Rapids, Michigan. As you all know, all military families have different situations and difficulties, you know. Uh, because of our constant movement. Unfortunately, this creating instability, not only for, for us, the adults, also for our children. My daughter is currently attending fifth grade on the Spanish immersion program at Northern Trail School located in Kent County. Unfortunately, we have to move again within Michigan 
but another town, which is Greenville. As parents, we did our research and there are no pro programs of Spanish immersion within the new county. Uh, if it's feasible, the reason of my calling today, if it's feasible, what we're requesting and and hopefully there's a solution, you know, uh, is that if, if it is possible that our daughter can be released from the new education district and be maintained in the current district in order for her to continue attending no training school. Um, it is for the be benefit, you know, for the benefit of everybody and not only for the benefit for the uh, of the family, it is basically for the benefit of her. We, this this will be the third change in less than six months of of military movement for her. And in your hands right now, and 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 wise decision of of you all. Uh, not only you're helping us, you're helping a military family too that is probably serving this country. It also helping a student emotional to man, a student to maintain it emotionally and stability at, at least for the next three years, three to five years that I will be stationed at this great state of Michigan. Uh, thank you all for your time. This is my, my statement right now in current situation. Hopefully, hopefully with your wise decision, you can help us out. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. If you could please state your name and where you're calling from, then you can provide your three minutes of public comment. Oh, great. Thank you so very much. I wasn't sure if uh, if it was going to happen or not, um, but my name is Jessica Mathiak, and I'm calling from Highland. Very good. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon. Okay, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jessica Mathiak, and I'm the founder of Michigan Save Our Kids, a network of over 14,000 Michigan parents, teachers, and professionals supporting the return to traditional values in our public schools. More and more, we are seeing the State Board of Education, third-party lobbyists, and political organizations push us farther and farther from educational excellence. According to a 2023 U.S. News & World Report, Michigan now ranks 37th for education. We are below state average on graduation rates and have a 37% proficiency rate on standardized tests. This Board of Education needs a significant wake-up call. The amount of time that six of you have spent on chasing unicorns and intentionally causing divisiveness is unparalleled. I'm here to completely oppose the resolution to affirm LGBTQ plus ideologies into our classrooms and athletics. To be clear, I believe that all students should feel safe and all students should feel welcomed by their teachers and peers. There is no need to push the envelope with radicalism by inserting sexual orientation into every aspect of the learning environment, and particularly at elementary levels. While I am assuming it is not the intent of the Board of Education to ostracize one group of students in place of another, but that is exactly what resolutions and policies like this do to our children, especially white heterosexual males. I happen to be the mother of two, and I will be damned if they have to continue the remainder of their education under the guise that they are an F, not worthy, not enough, a bigot, or any other derogatory word they will endure from supporters of this resolution. My seventh grade son was recently told that white Christian men are the problem with society. Do his feelings not matter? Does his identity not count? To exclude 90% of the student population, what will that accomplish? Schools have bullying policies in place. Schools have social workers and guidance counselors to support students in need. If there are not enough, then you have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure our governor allocates those resources. This piece of paper will accomplish nothing in that regard. As it pertains to athletics, while the MHSAA has not had the courage to stand firm in support of biological female athletes, it does not mean that the State Board of Ed needs to adopt measures that would implode every opportunity for women's rights and futures in sports. 
No one is denying a child the opportunity to learn and play. Go back to the drawing board and truly evaluate the state of our education system and stop ensuing chaos and personal agendas with non-academic rhetoric. We parents are exhausted trying to babysit so-called leaders. We simply want our kids to learn their subject matter from content experts and leave values and social issues to the parents. Per our Constitution, it is our right and you folks must stop infringing on them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You do the same. Thank you. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Got it. If you please state your name, where you're calling from, then you can begin your three minutes of public comment. Thank you. My name is Dr. Tu Francis, and I am a professor at Oakland University. I'm calling from Rochester Hills, um, and I'm the coordinator of their secondary education program. Very good. Thank you. So Go ahead. Last, oh, thank you. Sure. For the last couple of years, I have worked on the Social Studies Standards Setting Committee with the MDE and with colleagues from around the state. As a committee, we've spent countless hours debating and consulting with other experts in their respective areas. We have struggled with the central task placed before us to create the next standard set that will guide teacher education for the next five to 10 years. I would like to assert to our board that this group consisted of some of the best social studies minds in our state. While some of you may not agree with every decision we made, I hope you all will support these standards as they truly represent the best knowledge in the field of social studies. We were careful to make these standards practical, achievable, nonpartisan, and most of all, forward thinking. I understand that one area of concern was with including informed action as one of the central driving forces of social studies. It seems that some of our board equate informed action with a far leftist orientation. And this seems like just more ways to influence our children politically. I said this last time I spoke and I will say it again. That understanding of informed action is quite frankly naive and insulting to our committee of experts in social studies. And it discounts the years we spent for no pay, developing these standards. Social studies is centrally about participating in our political processes. As such, informed action is about, first and foremost, being informed, understanding where to get reliable information about candidates and issues, how to see through propaganda and bias and make personal decisions based on sound information. Also, informed action is about taking action, knowing where to go and what to do to be active and involved in the decision-making processes of our country. It can mean writing letters to and calling elected officials, finding and joining organizations that match our political orientations. It means attending local government meetings and meeting with local officials. None of these are partisan activities. They are simply things politically active people do in this country. Informed action is our way of ensuring the next generation of children is ready to carry the mantle for our country in legal and productive ways. I'm not sure how on earth anyone could have a problem with any of these, but I suspect it has more to do with their own personal partisan approach more than anything our teachers are doing. As a whole, I appreciate your work as a board and I support and your support for Michigan schools, teachers and students. I wholeheartedly urge you to support this set of social studies standards so our teacher prep programs can finally get back to work updating and improving our programs. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? Hello, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good, after good afternoon. My name is Katie McFarland, and I'm a parent in the Troy School District. The LGBTQ community has been hijacked by trans activists who are exploiting and abusing our most vulnerable population, minor age children. If I were to ask everyone in the room to raise their hand if they absolutely loved everything about going through puberty and were happy all the time during their adolescence, not a single hand would be raised. We have tragically seen a rise in the percentage of kids who claim they are in the wrong body. Why is this happening? Kids are being exposed to predators on social media 
and abusive adults who are actually telling children their gender was assigned to them at birth rather than tell a child they are perfect the way they were created. Have any of you ever bothered to read or listen to the stories of people who went through medical transition as a minor and regretted it? I highly recommend you watch the documentary entitled Damaged, and you will hear their stories. It should break your heart as it did mine. Statistics show that there are higher rates of suicide after transition, not before, as a trans activist love to gaslight the population into believing. I recently attended a conference and had the opportunity to meet January Littlejohn. She made national news as her daughter was socially transitioned behind January and her husband's backs by school counselors and administrators. Thank God January's daughter came to realize she was going through adolescent confusion and anxiety as a tomboy. And with the help of her loving parents, she did not go down a path of destruction by mutilating her body. Sadly, not every child has been saved and have fallen prey to predators, such as the trans activists shouting the words tolerance and acceptance when they are the very ones enabling minors not to accept themselves for how they were born. Make no mistake, gender affirming care is chemical castration and child abuse. History will judge those who have inflicted this incredible harm on minors, including you, those of you on this board who support this agenda on our most vulnerable population. I would like to thank Ms. Snyder and Mr. McMillan for always being the voices of truth and common sense on this board. I highly admire and respect you both. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Mike, is there any other callers that have uh, in the queue that have pre-registered for today's meeting? Um, yes, there's one more. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Got it. If you'll please state your name and where you're calling from, you can begin your three minutes. Sure. Thank you. Bree Mogenberg from Mount Pleasant. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, I'm really disappointed that I can't be there in person. Um, it's always glorious to see your wonderful faces. I know some of you don't usually tend to pay attention anyway, um, but Nikki and Tom, I want to extend a giant thank you because you really do always pay attention and you always listen uh, to both sides of the equation. You know, the mind is everything and you become what you believe. And I can see that now as a child care provider more than ever, especially when I look across the educational system, that our children really become what they believe. And the more rhetoric that's pushed onto them, the more dissolve in their minds they have with clarity to be able to understand who they are. There's so much that's put on their shoulders. Recently, the CDC had released a survey that shows three in five girls, that's 57% of girls in school, felt persistently sad or hopeless. And while 57% of our girls feel sad, not only do we have the MEA and the NEA acting like nothing but political entities, pushing political rhetoric onto our students in their education, but now the State Board of Education wants to do the same thing with political rhetoric. And rather than looking at the students in totality, we're again pushing LGBTQ. Whatever is on our minds becomes what we believe, and you are responsible for pushing this onto our children, and this is, in fact, responsible for the clutter and distraction that is in the minds of so many students when they should be in school. We're now focused on this. We're not focused on all children that are bullied. Again, I, I want to say uh, two words to you that I brought up last month. Jim Crow. That is exactly what is happening right now. When you create and give a division to a group and a class of students, you, in fact, are bullying all of those other students that are being left out, and you are responsible for creating the division. There are two sexes. Yes, there are many sexual orientations, and there are many gender identities, but kids are bullied for many reasons, and sexuality is not the only reason that kids are bullied. So when you are pushing this political rhetoric, ask yourself how you're helping the students. And instead, let's start looking at the entire scope of what's taking place. I appreciate your time. 
again, I hope that some of you paid attention because I can think of two that normally don't. I will continue to be a provocateur and I will ask all of the other parents to do up and, and say the same thing. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Do you mind muting your your video in the background, please? It's muted. Thank you. If you could please state your name and where you're calling from, you can begin your three minutes. So, Ellen Kazarczyk. I'm calling from Naples, Florida. Um, I'd like to comment on the resolutions, the LBGTQ resolutions. First, do no harm. A decade ago, gender dysphoria was incredibly rare, less than one half of 1%. The 600% increase uh, in LGBTQ and transgender cases, especially in girls, in the last decade is caused by social contagion, not unlike eating disorders, suicide, cutting, and other contagions that have been glamorized and promoted on social media and in schools. Studies prove that without drug intervention or social pressure, gender dysphoria disappears in 85% of children by the time they complete adolescence and go on to enhance, to embrace their um, biological chr chromosomal identity. When you as a board cross the boundary from your fundamental education mission <laughs> into social and psychological realm, the public has a right to demand a clear scientific consensus behind doing so. Where is your evidence-based research and scrutiny of the side effects and impact of these policies. This resolution will elevate, glamorize, and promote psychological points of view that harm children and normalize them as a social contagion. Where is the harm in you stepping back and staying out of it? Powerful profit-based interests are behind an agenda that encourages and exploits children and markets treatments like puberty blockers, surgeries, and premature psychological interventions. No chemical or surgical treatments have been approved by the FDA for this use. They are proven, in fact, to cause greater dysphoria, sterility, osteoporosis, mood disorders, seizures, cognitive impairment, and major depression, among other things. Prominent physician organizations in the UK, Sweden, Australia, and the American College of Pediatricians have warned us against cultivating gender confusion through social contagion. World-renowned psychiatrist Dr. Christopher Gilberg stated, pediatric transition is possibly one of the greatest scandals in medical history. He has called for an immediate moratorium on this practice. Why would you want to do anything to encourage it? I urge this board to read the research, step back. First, do no harm. Anything else is malpractice. Please do not attach your name to this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Mike, are there any other callers who have pre-registered today? There are no other callers. Thank you so much. Thank you to all those who provided public comment today. Uh, I'd like a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of April 11th, 2023. Thank you, Dr. Pickett. Dr. Pickett moves. Do we have a second? Dr. Robinson seconds. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Clifton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Yes. And Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. <coughs> Thank you, board. Next item on today's agenda is proposed standards <coughs> for the preparation of middle school and high school social studies teachers. During this presentation, a proposal to the State Board of Education is shared for the approval of new standards for the preparation of middle grades, grades 5 through 9, and high school grades 7 through 12 social studies teachers. We welcome our presenters, backed by popular demand, Dr. Delsa Chapman, 
Deputy Superintendent, Division of Educator, Student, and School Support. Dr. Sarah Kate LeVan, maybe not. Dr. No. Sean Kotke, <laughs> um, Interim Assistant Director of the Office of Educator Excellence. And Ms. Darcy McMahon, Higher Education Consultant in the Office of Educator Excellence. This is a presentation to the Board. A vote for consideration of the proposed standards is on the agenda. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Presenters, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good afternoon, Board. We are returning today from the February 14th meeting. That seems so long ago. Um, we're back today seeking approval of the standards, and our lead presenter today, Darcy McMahon, Higher Education Consultant from the Office of Educator Excellence, will be supported with Dr. by Dr. Sean Kaki, our Interim Assistant Superintendent. Darcy? It's a promotion. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Darcy, go right ahead. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. It's good to see all of you again. And thank you for including this work on the board agenda today. We are here to present to you the proposed revised draft standards for preparing teachers of middle grades and high school social studies uh, for your approval. These draft standards were presented to you in February, as has been mentioned. And following that, uh, they were available for public comment and review. As you can see on the slide, there are many reasons why social studies teacher preparation standards were determined to be the next set of standards to be revised. Uh, this work is part of an ongoing process that began with revision of the teacher certification structure. Um, important MDE initiatives such as understanding and meeting the needs of the whole child, uh, integration of disciplinary literacy, a focus on comprehensive history instruction, and on equity also drive a need to revise these standards in line with those goals and initiatives. Finally, the current standards are almost 20 years old, and the Michigan K-12 Social Studies Standards and the National Council Social Studies Teacher Preparation Standards have both been updated in that 20-year window. And of course, these standards are important because all students deserve uh, teachers prepared with up-to-date standards. This work is in support of Goal 7 of the Michigan Strategic Education Plan to increase the number of teachers in areas of shortage. These standards will impact the preparation of education students, teacher candidates, uh, and middle grades and high school students will continue to have well-prepared social studies teachers. Research has clearly shown that well-prepared teachers have higher rates of retention in the profession thereby improving our teacher shortage issues. These standards impact the teacher shortage in two ways. First, ensuring that teacher preparation matches the content and skills needed for teaching. And second, uh, broad preparation matches the content and skills needed for, excuse me, broad preparation ensures that teachers are well prepared to teach courses where they are needed and placed. With these new standards, every middle grades and high school social studies candidate will earn a social studies endorsement, which would prepare them to teach all social studies courses at that grade band. They may add an optional additional endorsement uh, for extra depth of preparation uh, in one or more of the sub-disciplines, as you can see on the slide. This structure for the social studies endorsements was developed based on consideration of the cert Certification Structure Committee's recommendations, alignment with MDE goals and initiatives, and reviewing input from across the state. Multiple perspectives were represented with the, within the teachers, excuse me, the Social Studies Teacher Preparation Standards Stakeholder Committee by the 60 stakeholders and reviewers who directly contributed. The committee members represented social studies curriculum and instructional leaders, professional education organizations, including the Michigan Council for the Social Studies, Michigan Council for History Education, Michigan Geographic Alliance, and Michigan Center for Civic Education. Uh, educator preparation faculty, middle grades and high school teachers, multiple geographic regions, including the Upper Peninsula, public charter and private districts and institutions, and state and national leaders in social studies education, 
such as the Michigan Social Studies Supervisors Association, the Interfaith Religious Council of Metropolitan Detroit, and the Confederation of Michigan Tribal Education Directors. There are several key shifts found in these proposed standards. These shifts are very similar to those in other teacher preparation standards updates. They are, for example, practice-based. Uh, the proposed standards integrate both the social studies arc of inquiry practices and core teaching practices. This means that the standards embed teaching skills and abilities to engage students in conducting inquiries on social studies topics and issues as well as have a deep understanding and ability to develop relationships with students, with families, manage classrooms for, student, for students for learning, and have developed skills in best instructional practices. These standards also infuse equity, culturally responsive practices, and whole child principles throughout. The standards also encompass three critical aspects for preparing well-started beginning teachers knowledge, including of content, pedagogy, and of students, skills, including disciplinary inquiry skills and core teaching practices, and dispositions needed to form students into informed, active citizens of society. Finally, the specialized content knowledge for teaching is directly aligned to the K-12 standards, K-12 standards within these standards. This means that teacher candidates will have a deep and flexible understanding of the content they need to teach students. This can be seen, for example, in standard C2. Well-prepared beginning teachers of social studies disciplines implement learning sequences that leverage social studies disciplinary content and literacies, theories, technology, and research to support learners' mastery of the Michigan K-12 social studies standards. This tight focus on the content needed for teaching helps ensure well-prepared beginners and also enables programs to narrow the content scope for expedient program completion by candidates. Some expected programmatic impacts of this include more consistency and preparation across the state for all social studies teachers and clear alignment of content and pedagogy to the Michigan K-12 social studies standards. Upon presentation of the draft standards to all of you in February, the standards were made available for public review and feedback. This was done uh, via the web MDE website, and public comment was available via survey and email. There were 90 respondents in total to the survey. These respondents represented 27 counties all across the state and 43 professional education organizations. There were many and wide-ranging roles represented by these survey respondents, as you can see on the graph. There were a good number of K-12 teachers and ed educator preparation faculty, as well as parents and guardians. You can notice here that these totals would add up to more than 90, and that is because respondents could select more than one role. For example, a teacher could also select that they were a parent. The response to the draft social study standards was overwhelmingly positive, as can be seen on the graph here. 88% of the respondents support these standards or support them with minor revisions and zero respondents opposed these standards for teacher preparation. An example of a minor revision can be seen on page 11 of the public comment analysis document. This example uh, <coughs> given there is changing American to United States. An example of a more significant revision could be found on page 12, to 12 and 13 of the public comment analysis document where several respondents were suggesting revisions to the examples included. As a result, the stakeholder committee framed those examples as needing to be ones at the local, state, and national, and global levels, and were thus able to include some of the examples suggested by the public comment review, such as ensuring religious free freedoms, and made sure to note that the list is an EG list meaning that preparation providers 
may include and or use examples that are appropriate to their context of learners and locale. As can be seen in this next graph, 92% of the respondents felt that the proposed social <laughs> study standards were aligned very well or mostly to the Michigan K-12 social study standards, while no respondent said that it did not align to the K-12 standards. And finally, 92% of the respondents believed that the proposed standards represented what teachers needed to know and be able to do either very well or mostly, while 0% said it was not representative. There were three major themes to be noted in the comments given in public comment. First, there was a great number of comments, 17, that were generally supporting the draft standards, as can be seen on page 9 and 10 of the public comment analysis document. Second, respondents gave eight suggestions for minor revisions, as can be seen on page 10 and 11. These suggestions to reflect minor wording adjustments as described earlier. There were 18 suggestions given for more significant changes. These can be found on pages 11 through 18 of the analysis document. These comments had four themes. First, the C3 framework, uh, agreement with uh, the inclusion of that and for the need for more of it. Uh, the second theme was equity and diversity mostly supportive with two suggestions for a balance needed between using terms like diversity and unity, uh, which the committee addressed by including the core democratic value of the common good throughout the document. Concern with the number and types of examples was the third theme, which I mentioned previously. And lastly, concerns about ensuring enough content understanding, to which the committee pointed out that the content is based on content teachers must know to teach the K-12 social study standards, in fact, more directly aligned than in previous sets of standards. Finally, there were some comments generally noting system challenges and difficulties. Predominantly, those were outside the purview of the committee. Upon approval of these standards, the Educator Preparation Unit will begin technical assistance to teacher preparation programs to enact the standards, and programs will begin their revisions. Starting in November of 2023, there will be application windows for the programs to submit applications for revised programs to be approved. New candidates are first expected to enter programs as soon uh, as fall of 2024. Thank you so much for hearing uh, our presentation today and considering these standards, and please contact us with any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation. Uh, board members, questions, comments, concerns? Uh, Dr. Pritchett, as a former social studies teacher, would you like to begin? Uh, I appreciated your um, the way you organized the public comments the report we got earlier um, to, um, I don't know, it just aligned with my brain anyway, <coughs> anybody else's, uh, as far as um, what you did with the comments, uh, the fact they went back to the committee and got some feedback. Um, uh, because I'm a formal, former social studies teacher, I have been in contact with some um, practicing teachers at this point uh, and some administrators. They have encouraged us to move forward with this. Uh, so um, thank you. Thank you very much. Other, uh, other board members looking around, looking around. Okay, very good. Um, seeing no other comments, we appreciate uh, your, your sharing. This is in line um, in a fashion with what we did with science as well. The, the notion of a generalist um, uh, certification with stackable endorsements on, on top thereof. And it's to create more flexibility in the, um, in the profession, a profession which um, is hammered by a current teacher shortage, which, which we're working out of. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Um, any other uh, questions or comments? Going once, twice, thrice, hearing none. 
Ms. Evans, please, if we could have a roll. Is there a motion? I'm sorry. We do need a motion. It's a good point. Would you like to make it? No, but once we get to discussion, I have. Very good. Um, uh, could we have a motion to um, move the, uh, the standards uh, from Dr. Pritchett, uh, second from uh, President Pugh. Uh, now to discussion. Uh, very good. Throughout these uh, standards, they reference both uh, the K-12 social studies standards and uh, the C-3 framework. Uh, both of which are horrendous. Um, I read from Michael uh, Judge uh, Michael Warren's uh, op-ed on June 8, 2019 in the Detroit News. Just a brief paragraph. First, the standards reject the founding first principles of our nation. Our Declaration of Independence holds as a self-evident truth that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Although the standards refer to unalienable rights, in passing, the document predominantly refers to individual rights. This is a monumental difference. It is a fundamental, it is fundamental to our understanding of who we are as human beings and the role of the government. Unalienable rights are given to us by nature and nature's God. They are born in us and stay with us our entire life. They cannot be taken away by government. In fact, the government exists to preserve those rights. Individual rights, by contrast, can be given or revoked by government. Social Security benefits, welfare payments, driver's licenses, and other benefits are individual rights dependent on the government. If our students do not grasp the difference, they will not understand that they are sovereign students, sovereign citizens with a divine spark who are in charge of the government, not the other way around. The understanding of unalienable rights is a keystone of liberty. And he goes on, uh, and I recommend <coughs> that, uh, that uh, op-ed, certainly, uh, Anyone who would like to have, you know, consider citizens as subjects uh, and to uh, rule them uh, authoritatively would uh, certainly like these standards. Um, secondly, the national, uh, as far as the C3 framework, and, and like I said, these standards that we are being asked to vote on, throughout everything it talks about the C3 framework and the socialized standards. And I'll just uh, read the conclusion to the National Association of Scholars David Randall uh, article of June 22nd, 2021, issue brief, the C3 framework. Conclusion, the C3 framework substitutes process for content, yokes social studies standards instruction to the failed common core curriculum, politicizes social studies instructions, and subordinates all of social studies instruction to civic actions, which replaces civics education with vocational training for left-wing community organizing. No state should adopt the C3 framework. So uh, certainly uh, this is uh, an authoritarian, uh, you know, these standards fit in line with that, um, and I certainly couldn't support them at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. McMillan, Ms. Snyder. I'll just echo what's already been said about these standards. Um, it is not acceptable for public education to uh, essentially mold the political identity of students. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other uh, board comments? Any other board comments? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a, a motion, a second. We've had discussion. Uh, the chair got a little bit ahead of himself, but uh, has righted himself. Ms. Evans, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Mr. Bullock? Yes. Ms. Lipton? Yes. Ms. Millen? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? No. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Evans. Uh, board, it is, thank you, presenters. We appreciate it. Thank you for your forbearance you. and your clarity. Um, for the next item on today's agenda is a presentation on surrogate parent guidance and State Board of Education policy. This presentation will update the request to rescind the State Board of Education's policy for the appointment of surrogate parents for special education services. Presenters will share the history of the policy and rationale for rescission. Policy in question is no longer required mm -hmm. under Michigan Administrative Rules for Special Education, or so-called MARS rules, no longer aligned with federal law. At the conclusion of the presentation, the board will have an opportunity for discussion and questions and will be asked to rescind 
or otherwise amend its 2008 policy on the appointment of surrogate parents for special education services. We welcome our presenters, Dr. Scott Kennigschneck, also back uh, by popular demand, Deputy Superintendent P20 System and Student Transitions, Ms. Rebecca McIntyre, uh, I beg your pardon, Ms. Terry Rink, Director of the Office of Special Education, and Ms. Rebecca McIntyre, the Assistant Director of the Office of Special Education. Um, this is uh, an informational presentation, but there will be a, a board vote uh, asked for at the end of the presentation. Uh, presenters, welcome. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and thank you, board, for allowing us to come back <clears throat> and have additional conversation around this particular policy. So Rebecca is going to kick the presentation off um, and take us back to last month, provide again the history to this particular issue. And as Dr. Rice indicated, um, uh, we will also then discuss potential paths um, to move the issue forward. So Rebecca. Sure. Thank you. So we're just going to go over, start with a little review about our topic today is the State Board of Education policy for the appointment of surrogate parents. Um, it was developed in 2008 and it conflicts with the IDEA. And specifically, it conflicts in the way that it allows an employee of an agency that cares for the child to act as a surrogate parent. And the IDEA does not allow for that. So there's, there's conflict in that area. So some specific IDEA requirements that I wanna call your attention to are that a, a surrogate parent can never be appointed if there's already an individual who meets the definition of a parent in the student's life, and parent is clearly defined in the IDEA. And then also, again, what I just stated, a surrogate parent cannot be an employee of any agency involved in the education or care of the child. And so if we, if we look at that in Michigan, that would be like Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, um, any child caring agencies or placing agencies, um, which might be um, some, some foster homes and things like that. And Ms. McIntyre, for, for those listening at home, IDEA is? Uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Okay, it's a federal special education law, right? It is Very our federal good. special education Thank law. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have two documents that we discussed at the last board meeting, the 2008 policy for the appointment of surrogate parents. It was um, developed and approved back in 2008. And in 2013, there was a Michigan Administrative Rules for Special Education um, there's a rule, it's 340-1725-F, and it was revised to require districts to appoint surrogate parents, excuse me, appoint surrogate parents in accordance with the IDEA requirements. So where previously districts were relying on um, the State Board of Ed policy, that rule pointed to the IDEA regulations. So as Dr. Rice indicated, as he was uh, helping us get started with this particular uh, board item, the board has two options um, this afternoon. The first, uh, as Dr. Rice had shared, is to rescind the current 2008 policy as it does not align with uh, IDEA. Or the other option, and uh, Mr. McMillan referenced this last month, is to potentially amend the, the current policy to basically make it align with federal IDEA requirements. And so those are the, the two options that are before uh, the board this afternoon. And if the board so chose to uh, move through or move forward with an amended uh, policy, uh, you can see kind of a timeline uh, that we've created here. We reference the 2008. We would reference uh, uh, the update to comply uh, with uh, excessive, uh, website accessibility changes in 17. And then it would simply read, uh, as of June 1st, 2023, the policy was amended to align with the requirements of IDEA. Uh, in its implementing regulations and to incorporate the Michigan Department of Education Office of Special Education. So there's the presentation board. Um, if we, uh, if we uh, could have questions or uh, comments, that would be great. And then we can uh, have a motion. Mr. McMillan. Thank you. I think last month, uh, I think it was Ms. Ms. Rink who uh, said that um, Something this had to be rescinded in order for something to go into place uh, that by the department, you know, because I was kind of surprised that okay, so what you're saying is that something can't go forward unless we rescinded it. So whatever that was, that's going to that would be put into place. Is it basically that? I mean, is it is it just a couple sentences? 
Yes. So the the recommendation to the board is to rescind. That was the recommendation last month. Right. Uh, as we bring this forward this month, that certainly continues to be a recommendation. But the board has the option to amend, and the amendment would simply read right. that the policy would be amended to align with IDEA. No, my question is, is that if we did rescind it, I was under the what would be put in its place? Like I was told that something can't go into place, that you can't put something in place unless we rescinded the current policy. What what is it that would go into place? Is it basically that? The department would put something in place that basically says that, or is it more than that? The policy would be amended to say that the uh, policy. Not the policy. The, uh, we, uh, Regulation. Okay. Yeah, it, it, I, if we do option one, I'm not advocating it, but if we did option one and rescind it, yep. then I was told that uh, something would go in its place, that the, the department would put something in its place. We would provide guidance to ISDs that basically the policy had been rescinded, or in this case, if, you, if the board chooses to amend, we would still provide that update. Right. But no, let's say ISDs. we're not ending. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tom, I'm not following you. <laughs> so what it, whatever you're putting in place, is it real simple, like just a couple sentences, or is there more to it? That's what I'm kind of wondering is, uh, when, if we rescinded the policy and did nothing else, and you were going to put something in its place. You were going to put something, an uh, MDE policy. We would put an MDE guidance document. Guidance out document. That we would that guidance document basically be that, or is there more to it? Uh, it would reference that it had been rescinded or aligned, and then there are other. Uh, we would specify the updates. Uh, we would specify what's been pulled out. That no longer can you use uh, an agency representative as a surrogate parent. So we would spell out the changes therein. But we could, and you're okay with just that amendment? The amendment to the policy, we would still right. provide communication to ISD so they're aware that things have been changed and aligned per the amendment. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. McMillan. Other board members, any questions or comments? Ms. Lipton. So I just want to um, make sure that I'm clear as I understand it, the the guidance um, uh, board policy is entirely uh, in contravention to the IDEA. Um, rescission would be uh, eliminating that uh, noncompliance. Is there anything else, in your opinion, um, that? Um, would be um, would be covered by the guidance document that the rescission would somehow is is there anything else other language or anything that rescinding the policy um, would somehow be not dealt with that would sort of come back at a later date, oh, drat, we forgot that this really needed to be covered. Anything at all that you can think of? I do not believe so, Rebecca. At this time, not that we are aware of. Um, that that specific statement definitely is, is the area that's conflicting with IDEA. Um, remember that the Office of Special Education does already have current guidance, has, has had since 2015, and so there are those two pieces, the board policy and the guidance. Um, and the guidance is actually providing um, a deeper look into, uh, you know, and we're looking at updating that as well, as um, for children birth to three and, um, you know, students when they reach the age of majority. None of that stuff is in the board policy. Uh, and so the board policy would be duplicative of, of the, the Office of Special Education guidance and in conflict with IDEA. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Mr. Bullock. So I'm, I'm following up with uh, Ms. Lipton. So for clarity, we rescind, the guidance document goes in, which is a, ref which is a reference to compliance with the federal guidelines and you update some things in the amendment are we still doing the same thing mm -hmm. okay just an amended board policy the board policy stays but it's amended we continue to provide communication and guidance to ISDs all right thank you mr both mr uh, mcmillan um and kind of briefly but i guess this is the first time i've heard that uh 
the authority of a board policy. I just want to make sure I think it's it's uh, pertinent to the discussion because um, we're talking about either rescinding or amending a board policy. So what I'm hearing is, is that the department cannot issue guidance that is contrary to a board policy. Is that right? I don't think it's good practice. I mean, well, I was told last month that they can't, you can't issue the guidance unless we rescinded. So it wasn't that we don't think it's good policy. I, I was told maybe incorrectly last month that there was an inability that, the, that you know, and, and I guess I'm just wondering, maybe we have a little more authority than I thought we did. Um, and I'm wanting to explore that. So is it true or not that uh, a board policy, um, that a, uh, the department's issuance of guidance cannot be contrary to a board policy? It is true that a, um, a department's guidance should not be contrary to state or federal law. But if, a, um, but if a board policy is, in fact, contrary to state or federal law, then it can issue guidance that is contrary to board policy. And it should then um, work with the board to amend board policy to make it consistent with state or federal law. Well, and I guess to some degree, and I don't mean this anything other than just the reality of the situation, the board hires a state superintendent. If, this, if the board says, I want this policy, and the state superintendent, under his guidance, the department issues something contrary, if, that's, if it becomes a significant issue, the board superintendent may not have a job, I guess. Or, I mean, they, they, that's the weight of it. I mean, that, that would be kind of how. It, it is, it is a, uh, and it's, a, it's a reality that, um, that, that sometimes, uh, like this time, you have to choose between an office following, um, right. no, following no, like, right. federal law, right. Uh, right. of which it is aware, right. or a board policy that's uh, a decade plus, now 15 years dated, of which it is oblivious. I understand. And, and when we were implementing, and we, we as a board re issued, I guess we voted not to uh, implement A through F uh, and, and to actually just do a... Um, Dashboard. A dashboard. We were basically saying this is what we want as a policy. I guess the department could have gone against it, but that was what we were saying. And then uh, I think, I, never mind. You're I, don't recall, I, just, I don't recall a, a vote we, post, um, post approval of A through F that said that you didn't want no, it, way it back, followed. even further. Back after I got on here in 2017. I got you. So, so pre passage. Yeah. Pre law. Yeah. No, but there, yeah, there was an interest in. Um, doing something with us, or you were here, remember yeah. that? Yeah, we were really raggling. The department was heading towards A to F, and we kind of put a, right. a kibosh on that uh, as a board. So at any rate. That kibosh. was under the interim super I don't like that. state kibosh. superintendent. Right. Yes. Yes. yes, kibosh is a great word. Okay. So you, you, put a, yes. you put a kibosh on a, a non-law. Well, we can't circumvent state law once it became state law. Right, it wasn't, right. yeah. It wasn't state law, it was... Uh, it was moving rapidly. Moving in a... Poly the, yeah. yeah, the department's... Okay. You, you expressed, you expressed right. opposition to a piece of legislation. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it wasn't really... Like, no, it wasn't. It was... It was uh, we had to submit <laughs> something to the feds. I raise my hand? As a, uh, or yes, we had, we had to, to submit the plan. How we were going to do accountability. Do and, accountability. And the department wanted there was some discussion about doing A to F, and we said no. All right, one, one, let's, anyway. go, let's go one person at a time. Yeah. Thank you to the two of you. Ms. Snyder, to you. I was just going to interject to say we did the thing that we constitutionally are accountable to do, which is to provide oversight in K through 12 through that kind of policy resolution so okay. thank you um, any any more uh, reflections on um, on the issue at hand Ms. Lipton just, just one more question um, in your in your opinions um, is having a an amendment that essentially functionally acts as a rescission of a guidance that is in contravention to federal law, um, is there potential of causing confusion in terms of um, 
why is there this guidance that, in a sense, does absolutely nothing other than tell us to comply with federal law, such that perhaps in the field it might be more clear to just simply not have it? Is so the recommendation last month was to rescind, and the recommendation this month is to rescind as well. But again, the board has the option to amend. Um, thank you, Ms. Lipton. Mr. McMillan. I, I guess, I mean, I would just prefer, uh, and I know there's been some discussion uh, from those in the field uh, of special education, that it's better that we retain, I don't know if I want to say authority, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess authority that, uh, that we are doing something, we have our policy, and that the, the department is going to follow our policy, and I have no problem bringing that into alignment with uh, with IDEA and what it should be, and then the department issue guidance according to that policy, which will then be aligned to IDEA. So I would prefer that direction. I don't know uh, if I can make a motion. Uh, well, I mean, if you're ready to, I would like to make a motion that we amend it as requested. Okay. So we have a uh, we have a motion on the table from Mr. McMillan that we uh, amend our board policy to indicate uh, quite simply that the, uh, the board policy is to comply with federal law. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So that we have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion. Do we have a second? <laughs> so moved. So we have a motion and a second. <laughs> motion from Mr. McMillan, a second from Ms. Snyder. Is there any discussion <laughs> associated with that uh, motion right. and the second? Um, hearing none. If we could have a roll call vote, please, um, Ms. Evans. Bullock? Nay. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Hugh? No. Robinson? No. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? No. Motion fails. Okay. So we have a, we have a failed motion relative to um, amendment of board policy. Would someone like to move? Um, uh, make a motion associated with the rescission of the policy. Uh, Dr. Robinson. Move to rescind the policy. So we have a motion to rescind. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mr. Bullock. Is there any discussion associated therewith? So if we rescind it, that means that they won't have surrogate parents? No. Oh. That means that we will, we will be complying with IDEA. And I what IDEA was. says regarding surrogate parenting, and specifically that as an agency, it was so that, that, that works goes with, in, in compliance know. with the requirements that are laid out on page four. <laughs> on page four, tell me what you mean by four. Page. Slide four. Slide four. A surrogate go back parent to may four? never be appointed for a child when there is another person who meets. Right. The definition of a parent, a surrogate parent cannot be an employee of any agency involved in the education or care of the child. Correct. That, that is, all that we're doing is changing it to come to line up with that. The answer is yes. The, the answer is no. decision of the policy no. then makes patently obvious that it is simply IDEA that controls, that there isn't a, a potential tug between a board policy <clears throat> and federal law. If you know anything about the relative um, importance of the two, you're not surprised that federal law trumps board policy. Um, but this will remove all doubt. Is that fair? It will bring an alignment. It will bring the current language into alignment with IDEA. There you go. Yes. So it does more than that. It is um, the board choosing to rescind the policy instead of amend it through its constitutional authority to have oversight over K through 12 policy in the state of Michigan actually says that a bureaucratic body will interpret federal law and then therefore um, create practice. So I think that's something that um, Michigan needs to know because that's something that we are supposed to be doing. I, I don't think a state board of education would try to trump federal laws if they think it ha that has authority over the federal government. Um, but it is interesting to see those who are supporting a rescission of this policy instead of amending it. Okay. Um, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Snyder. Mr. McMillan. 
I would just say that, you know, given the discussion, I think maybe we should do more policy, even though I'm in the minority and probably will disagree with some of it, but at least there will be, you know, interesting discussion. I think that this board uh, should be telling the department what it wants and not wants, what basically the people of Michigan want and don't want, instead of the bureaucracy deciding itself. So um, I certainly know, I understand there are federal laws, there are state laws, but there are also the implementation of those laws. And it would be nice, now that I'm thinking about it and we're having this discussion, that we should be issuing policies, which I pro I'm sure the incentive is the department doesn't want this body telling it what to do. Mm -hmm. So the incentive is don't even bring it to us, don't talk about it, rescind it, anything that's out there, just start rescinding because, you know, we don't really want you to have any authority. We just want to do what we want to do. Uh, so I, you know, given this, I think we should, I, I'm told by very good sources that I, that the department is making it almost impossible for kids that have dyslexia to get an IEP and that the ISDs like that, you know, and so they're catering to what the ISDs want, but to the harm of the kids. I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe we should debate that and have a policy um, and, and issue it. I think we maybe should issue, be issuing all kinds of policies. So I certainly, you know, I guess that's in line with not wanting to rescind this policy. I think that, that we ought to have even more given the discussion today. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. Uh, Ms. Lipton. The, in, in your opinion, you, the federal law is one layer and then the state's rulemaking authority under the Michigan Administrative Rules Governing Special Ed, which I've seen, is it like yay thick, we're thinking? <coughs> pretty, pretty thick, yeah, more than, <laughs> more than a couple of lines on a board policy. In your opinion, as to the propriety of who can act as a surrogate parent, because special education has an awful lot of components. And we can, I think, agree that we're talking about a very tiny sliver here in terms of the propriety of the statement of who is appropriate to act as a surrogate parent under federal law. In your opinion, is the Michigan Administrative Rules on Special Education sufficiently clear now and in light of a potential confusing rescission or uh, rescission of a confusing board policy, is that sufficient to guide the propriety, propriety and protection of these vulnerable children in terms of who can act as a surrogate parent? Yes. I, I believe it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Um, Please, Ms. Tilly. That I think it would be helpful or would have been helpful if, especially going forward, that was set for precedence. When we have these types of discussions, it would be helpful if we have the two policies in front of us. <laughs> I said that so, last month. I think that would be helpful. So we could even know what amendments if we were to make amendments. When you say the, the two policies. So the MDE policy for surrogate parents, which is what we're being asked to rescind, um, and the IDEA. I just pulled them up on the computer, but I'm just saying I think it would be helpful if we have those things in front of us. So we're, we're voting on a policy. We should have it in front of us. Fair enough. Um, the IDEA is not a policy, it's federal law, okay, and well, it's in federal violence. law. Yeah. We should Fair have enough. the law, we should have the policy, we That's should fine. have it in front of us. That's fine. Um, Mr. Bullock. I had several thoughts, but I was going to also say it also protects the parent who, so we just can't be assigning surrogate parents when there is a, a defined parent of said child, right? That is correct. And so it's it's not just protecting the child, it's the parent has rights that can't be, that takes other considerations before you can remove that. that, that, that. That's correct. Thank you. 
Um, other um, other questions or comments from board members? Um, hearing and seeing none, we have a motion on the table, a second associated with rescission. Uh, Ms. Evan, to roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Critchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? No. And Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Evans. Uh, we now move to um, we now move to report of the president. Um, hopefully, a really brief um, report. Uh, this week is Teacher Appreciation Week, and I think it just calls for a, just a very simple thank you, thank you to the countless teachers, educators that we have in our state who do the amazing work that they do day in and day out. Um, and I'll get to jump in front of um, Dr. Rice and, uh, and uh, board member Tilly and talk about the excitement that we had in Detroit um, for, the, for our new and incoming uh, teacher of the year. And so excited um, uh, to be able to be there um, for that. Uh, we've had some amazing uh, teachers of the year, and we know that Ms. Jackson will bring um, another special viewpoint, and we'll learn so much from her as we do from all of our teachers of the year. And so looking forward to that. Um, and I guess I'll just end with, you know, um, the Lakers and the Warriors are playing, and that's like the Super Bowl of Saginaw or of Michigan, and I know I'm getting my sports mixed up, but, uh, you know, it's an amazing... Hometown guy. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Not just Michigan graduates, not just um, uh, Saginaw graduates, but also Saginaw High School uh, graduate, so it's really exciting uh, to see, and I see you you um, smiling. So I, you know, I don't know who I'm rooting for. Second off, that's what's happening on TV. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know who I'm rooting for, but anyway, it's really exciting to see that. So, and that is my report. Thank you very much, President Pugh. Um, so, report of the state superintendent, just very briefly. I want to congratulate Dr. Diane Golzinski. Um, who is right behind uh, Mr. Bullock and Mr. McMillan. She has been named the Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations in the Michigan Department of Education. Diane previously was the Director of the Office of Health and Nutrition Services. Welcome to your new role minus the adjective. Uh, Uh, Dr. Golzinski, Scott Hutchins, Amy Wassman, and I represented Michigan in Detroit uh, last week at the Council of Chief State School Officers, CCSSO's Community of Practice in Student and Staff Wellbeing. We are in a four-state community of practice with Kentucky, Utah, and Rhode Island. Um, it's a pretty significant uh, effort. We're working together to improve uh, mental health of students and staff. It's a um, um, it's been an ongoing effort of ours in the state. It's an ongoing effort of other states across the, the country. And we appreciate the opportunity to speak with and learn from our colleagues from the, the other states in Detroit. We presented uh, Thursday morning, and I, I hope uh, all of the board members will at some point be able to hear uh, more substantially about our ongoing efforts around improvement of children's mental health we hope to come back to you in the fall um, with an update on those uh, those efforts. It seems like uh, every several months or so there are fresh things to report about uh, what we're doing. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thursday was a busy day. Um, last Thursday afternoon, um, we were um, we were in Detroit for a different uh, ceremony. Dr. Pugh, Ms. Tilly, and I at Man. Uh, learning community that just, just for those of you who are focused on um, uh, man versus woman, that's man with two ends, as in uh, probably Horace Man, I would imagine. Miss um, Candace Jackson, uh, third grade teacher at Man Learning Community, teacher of 34. 
third graders at Mann Learning Community, um, our 2023-2024 uh, Teacher of the Year. She has very large shoes to fill. <laughs> um, and Ms. Nanette Hansen, who's our 2022-2023 uh, Michigan Teacher of the Year. So looking forward to her contributions at this table. The, the passing of the, the torch, the crown, the throne, <laughs> go figure. Um, choose your uh, favorite analogy. Will be in uh, will be in August, um, so we look forward to that that sort of um, ritual. Um, but I would like um, to lift up Teacher Appreciation Month and, by extension, Teacher Appreciation Week, which is this week. This month, we've been showing videos of young people who um, who have uh, given shout outs to their teachers little mini videos. They're lovely. Um, if you haven't seen some of them, take a look at them on our, um, our website. I'd also like, uh, in tribute to our teachers, to share a, a little video, three minutes, five seconds, of state teachers of the year, including Ms. Hampson, um, giving a shout out to Joy in the profession. So this is, uh, if you will, an ode to Joy. And I will, I will not hum this um, for you, uh, but you can think of Ode to Joy as you hear our teachers' reflections about joy in the profession. Uh, Ms. Cook, if you would, please. Gosh, I'm going to try not to cry. Okay. <laughs> so I have amazing students. Joy to me is all the little things. Joy is something you have to find. It is something you have to choose. They come from every part of the world. It's the high fives. It's the smile. Joy in the classroom is completely contagious. Like, who can get excited about photosynthesis? My students can, because I am. They're with me every step of the way after we put in all these hours of practice, and we, we get to that point where we're just feeding off of each other. That is my joy. That is my heaven right there. And they show me their faces of surprise and tell me I can read, I understand. Getting kids who are maybe not sure they're going to be able to do it, to actually do it. When you have a child that you see the lack of confidence and you know they don't really believe they can do it, and then they get it. I find a lot of joy in, in kind of cracking the hard eggs. Potentially still struggling, but they knew that, that I was going to be struggling right along with them. When the lesson comes clear and they understand, and that's the satisfaction of teaching, knowing that you've helped somebody understand or even facilitate their learning. And the kids are engaged, and the kids don't realize that we're in a classroom. They're scientists, they're mathematicians, they're musicians, they're scholars. Using their own cultures and seeing themselves where they fit in the world, it brings me joy to see them flourish and grow and, and find themselves. When we have that sense of belonging and when students of like all these diverse abilities get to play, socialize, and learn together, their empathy, kindness, and all these acceptances of differences really grow. Just getting to look around my classroom and see all the shiny eyes. Students that are engaged and learning and there's light bulb moments. Watching their eyes light up when, you know, they get that aha moment and they build that confidence that they can do something. They're able to lead, they're able to assist, and they're able to facilitate their own learning. One of my students posed a question and another student answered it on my behalf. And that, to me, is essential. My students are learning from one another. Seeing the rapid change in the mindset of students and how they view education as a tool to succeed and to progress in their lives. We are a team. We help each other out. And together, we will succeed. Watching students light up, seeing the fact that they are learning and they are able to build that sense of community and so they know that I love them and I'm there for them with my whole entire heart and my whole being. Students in our classroom start off as names on a roster and they end the year as part of our family. And that is the greatest source of joy for me. When my students become the context for my content, cultural, linguistic, and academic diversity all in one place. We'll send you the link. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty, pretty neat little, little video. And uh, with appreciation to Ms. Hansen for participating um, in that. I'm struck by, um, as you get older, um, your teachers leave. So this is what happens. And um, 
um, you're tempted to uh, think that you started where you are, um, but we all stand on the shoulders of others, um, our giants, um, our teachers. And uh, we do well to remember on whose shoulders we, we stand. I'm struck by the fact that as a young kid, I was really plugged into schools. And so it's not surprising that I remember my elementary teachers, Ms. Felton, Ms. Hazlett, Ms. Doddridge, Ms. Tope, Ms. Miller, Ms. Diedrich, by name, by grade, by room. Um, because they were, they were enormous in my life. They weren't my first teachers. My parents were my first teachers, but they were my second teachers, and they were really enormously important um, in my upbringing. And then into middle school with Ms. Robinson, may she rest in peace. She recently passed um, um, over 90 years old, Ms. Ruby Robinson, uh, Mr. Randolph, Mr. Giovinazzo, Ms. Butes. And then into high school with um, with VJR and Mrs. Young, Floquet, Ms. Ferraro, Mrs. Hughes, uh, Robin, Claude. I mean, these are people who who helped form me, and, and I honor them by by not just remembering their names, but remembering their stories and remembering how they taught. And it struck me that when I began to teach French, I taught French the way. My French teacher, uh, may she rest in peace, Robin Melnick, once uh, once did. But I took pieces of other people's teaching and made that into my own teaching. We really, um, we really do stand on other people's shoulders. And in appreciation for teachers, I would ask board members and staff members to just reach out to someone um, whom you appreciate because they taught you or because they taught one of your children or grandchildren. Most of my teachers are gone. And um, if they aren't gone, they're, um, they're, they're certainly up there in age, because I'm certainly up there in, um, in age. Um, but you can be 90 and a teacher and appreciate a kid, no longer a kid, um, saying thank you for what you did um, for, uh, for me. Um, it's one of the intrinsic rewards of the profession. We talk a lot about the ex extrinsic rewards of the profession, and they're enormously important. Um, I would never say otherwise, but the intrinsic rewards are important as well. And the, um, the calls, the notes, um, the I appreciate you, they're, they're, they're pretty important. And I would ask you um, to give a shout out um, to a teacher or teachers as you um, as you go through your next month. Uh, it's not an easy gig, and I don't care whether you have um, five kids in your class or 50 kids in your class. It's a tough gig. You know, I was struck by Karina talking about that ASD classroom of hers, and um, if you listened closely, you heard that she is a sophomore was uh, with six children, and there were three adults and Karina in that classroom. Um, that's still a lot of gig in an ASD classroom. And um, when I walked into Ms. Jackson's classroom at Man Learning Community, and you know I've walked into a couple classrooms in my my career, um, you can tell. Um, a, a classroom that's, um, that's packed to the gills. And I said to her, I said, wow, you've got a lot of kids. How many are in your class? She said, well, and Ms. Hansen, you'll appreciate this. So will you, Dr. Carnell. So too you, Dr. Chapman, Ms. Garcia, and others, Dr. Kendrick Schneer. She said, I've got 34 in my classroom normally. She said, but I'm missing seven today. So in other words, my reaction was to a class that was much smaller than she normally had. She normally had 34. Now, people who have never taught can't even imagine. 
um, if you've taught, you can feel the difference between a child or two in a classroom. You can feel the difference between uh, 29 and 27, for example. She's doing yo, yo woman's work in, um, at man learning community. But across the state, so too are 100,000 teachers a day. And they deserve our respect and appreciation. And I, I would hope that you would help me respect and appreciate them. And that is a great lead in to our next presentation. Uh, next item on today's agenda is the report of the Teacher of the Year. Ms. Nanette Hansen, current Michigan Teacher of the Year, will present her report. Um, as you may recall, Ms. Hansen is a first grade teacher at Lemmer Elementary School and Escanaba Area Public Schools. Unfortunately, our regional, uh, Region 9 Teacher of the Year, Mr. Carl Brownlee, was not able to attend uh, today's meeting. Mr. Brownlee is a, a warm loaf of bread, and we wish him, uh, we wish him well. Uh, Ms. Hansen, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice and the board members for having me here again. Um, like he said, we are going to sort of uh, digress from our regular format because Carl is not able to um, join me this month, but he will be back next month. So we will present our presentation next month. So I will be updating you on uh, a few of my goings on uh, for, for the National Teacher of the Year. And, uh, and I will update you on uh, me, essentially. Um, I have had a very busy few weeks. I am wrapping up my first grade year. Uh, because remember, I'm still full-time teaching uh, while I'm doing this role and the National Teacher of the Year role, and I'm loving all of it. I'm on very little sleep, but that's fine. I love coffee. It's my new favorite thing. Um, uh, we are getting ready to wrap up our first grade year with Camp Skeeter. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It seems to be a UP thing, um, and it started years ago with my first grade teacher, um, uh, Marilyn Anglum, who started the Camp Skeeter, and it is a community-based, it's really evolved. I've done it for uh, 17 years of, of teaching first grade, and we are amping up to that now. It's a big community-wide uh, event that we do with all of our seven uh, first grades, and th it's the big culmination to our year, so everything is in play for, for that, and my kids are very excited about that. And I've also been traveling back and forth to our nation's capital. I've actually never been there. And then I've been there twice in the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. So it has been an amazing time for me. Um, while I was there, I was traveling there to participate in the National Teacher of the Year program, uh, Washington Week. And that's a very carefully crafted and highly um, engaging professional development that is put together by CCSSO, which is the Council of Chief State School Officers, which you referred to earlier. And w they put together this program that allows for teachers to understand how to effectively instruct and advance um, equitable education. Uh, they uh, allow teachers to understand how to use their storytelling to um, create change for teachers and students. They um, help teachers make connections and foster relationships to um, um, influence policymakers and educational partners to help uh, our students and our teachers and to um, lift our profession. Uh, we partnered with several partners, Google for Education, TED, TED, Ed, TED Talks, uh, PBS, Public Broadcasting System, and they have one of those little clips like CCSSO made, um, and they came and observed us um, exchanging our lessons uh, with each other, all you know, high school all the way down to kindergarten and pre-K, which was, they videotaped and they are putting out on their PBS stations, which is wonderful for us because in first grade, uh, my kids love the Wild Kratts, and uh, if you've ever, if you guys are familiar with PBS, they have all the coolest stuff. So, um, and they gave out Fred Rogers bags. I mean, need I say more? I don't think I do. Um, everybody loves the stuff, and so um, we partnered, of, of course, with uh, Dr. Biden and, and Secretary Cardona, and they hosted us at a town hall meeting in the White House, which was, of course, 
so, you know, for, for a gal who grew up in the rural UP of Michigan, as a dream come true. It will, it, it will never happen to me again. So I was, I was truly grateful and blessed to be there. Uh, the Smithsonian partnered with us. Uh, I, we got to be part of the International Summit on the Teaching Profession and to see all of those people represented there and the things that they're doing great to bolster the profession was, it was just, I, I, I have no words to describe it. Um, NWEA was there, Northwest Evaluation Association. And of course, then we got to go to Capitol Hill and meet with our representatives and talk to them uh, about things that are, we're passionate about. And so if you look here, um, I've put together some pictures uh, from our trip. Uh, the first one shows the International Education Summit. The second one was, I was partnered with Ohio. Um, you know, you are rivals. Uh, when you get there, they put you together with, uh, you know, a close state. And so uh, when she came up to the outside of our, um, our reps, you know, door, and the big M was on the door in the Michigan State and the U of M, you know, she tried not to, she said her skin was a little bit burning, but, and, and then um, uh, Representative Slatkin came out and she, she may or may not have twisted the knife a little bit, but um, it was, it was a very educational experience for me. Um, she had so, so many um, uh, educational policies that I think were important to me, safety, of course, of schools. And I, you know, uh, she's a former CIA agent and she did say, you know, I think that we could probably do with a few less CIA agents and we could use some more money for education. And I felt, um, that was a great answer. Uh, and so, um, that, those were some of the things we did. Of course, White House Day, was the day that we got to meet with Dr. Joe Biden and Secretary Cardona, and they asked us our personal opinions about what we actually see going on in education and what we need to further education to make it equitable for all students across the board. And they really actually listened because some of the things that we discussed, they later brought up at the summit with all, you know, where all the representation was. And so we really did feel like our voices were being heard and that we, you know, were making a difference. Um, Smithsonian. Now, they bought, they made boxes of goodies, and you know how teachers love freebies. Um, a big, huge box came with books and bags and stickers and all of these things that we can readily use in our classrooms, and they were all tailor-made. They were all tailor-made. So I was a first grade teacher, so it was tailor-made for me. And if you were a high school you know, reading teacher, they were tailor-made for them. And so they took a lot of care uh, and time to, to tailor educational opportunities for us and for our kids. And so you know, we felt very appreciated and seen by them. And then, of course, when we spent the day with them, they tailor-made opportunities for us to um, use their platforms that they have to bring the Smithsonian to our kids. So in the UP of Michigan, of course, we're probably not gonna get a chance to go there in first grade, but virtually we can. And so they showed us all of those opportunities and it was wonderful. And then there's a picture of us, DC at night. We went on a bus tour, 7, 7.30 to 11. Uh, and for an old lady like me, 11 is late. <laughs> and so it was hard. But we, we toughed it out, and we got to see all of the monuments. And, and, I mean, you could spend weeks there, and you'd never see everything. And it was, it was wonderful. Um, uh, this was uh, just referring to the town hall meeting again, like I said. I really felt like they were listening uh, to what we were saying. It's really wonderful as a teacher to have a sitting uh, first lady who is a teacher currently teaching full time in a, a secondary ed. It was it was wonderful. Then um, uh, this is when they announced the new National Teacher of the Year, Rebecca Peterson, and they hosted all of the teachers in the Rose Garden. Again, a surreal, a surreal experience for me. Um, something that you know will never happen to me again. But they were wonderfully. It was a wonderfully crack crafted day and program, and they had a reception afterwards in the White House, and we all felt lifted and, and held, uh, you know, by that administration. And here's the, here, here's the culminating picture, which I will be having framed and put on my wall. Um, and then, it was home for three days, and then the NEA flew us back, flew me back, 
and I took my husband because he refuses to stay behind. And um, <laughs> I was awarded the California Casualty Award. Um, the awards for teaching excellence recognizes educators from around the country who promote both excellence in teaching and advocacy for the profession which is, of course, the top of my priorities. Educators are honored through three types of awards, California Casualty Awards, Horace Mann Awards, and the NEA Member Benefits Awards. And they gave out serious cash. The top five Horace Mann Award winnies were, winners were $10,000, and the big award winner was $25,000. And it was really a sight to behold. These educators, I was awestruck by them. They were doing things, so many amazing things, and uh, for me to be able to be in the same room with them felt like I really like hit the jackpot. Um, and so, uh, you know, Coding for Girls was one of the um, platforms that one of the, uh, of the awardees was talking about. And just, just the number of wonderful things that are going on in education across this nation are, are, are so, are so so far reaching and we need to see more of these positive things uh, instead of you know really focusing on all of the negative things that are going on. Um, oh yes. I felt like a superstar. I, I mean these jumbo charms and it was just anyway, it was a it was amazing. Oh, wait, I got to get this off. Okay. So anyway, um, to wrap this up, um, you know, because of this Michigan Teacher of the Year platform that I, w that I was able to, to have and, and all of these doors that have been opened to me, I have seen uh, the greatness of educators, uh, the greatness of education, and, and, and just to sort of echo everything that has gone on here today. It was so wonderful to see these, these kids in the, in the new teacher pipeline, and I'm thinking, how can I do this in the UP, and who do I need to talk to? So um, these are, are things, great things that are going on, and, um, you know, these opportunities are, you know, are, I will forever be grateful for, and, um, I, and I, just appreciate, I, I just appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Mm -hmm. um, let's give any, um, any questions or comments associated with Ms. Hanson's uh, presentation? I have, have questions. Okay. Oh, you, no, you, I'm you sorry. The center stage. Oh, um, I felt like a superstar. For <laughs> it was like, wow. Um, so, first of all, let me say thank you for, for um, taking on this role as our mTOY. Um, last year, I was very impressed with your broad knowledge of the issues um, when, when I got a chance to interview you on the panel, when I was a part of the panel. So um, I wanted to know, a lot of the work that you guys do is actually behind the scenes. It's not at the table. So can you tell us some more of the work you've done with the art toys, um, as well as, you know, some of the issues that you have um, tried to maybe combat from your role. You know, some of the yes. issues we're facing in education Absolutely. that you've tried to work on from Absolutely. your role. So each month when I come here with the art toys, it's really, uh, I, I'm allowing them to pick the thing that they're passionate about and then I'm using my commonality with it. And I think all the issues that we've really brought here to the table are things that are, are important to us. But the thing that I personally hold the most important is positive mental health supports. I think that coming out of the um, pandemic, uh, you know, the cracks that were sort of being held together barely before the pandemic mm -hmm. really started to shine through. And, um, you know, I teach first grade and I still see, you know, the, uh, the wide range of, of uh, mental health supports that kids need. And I live in the UP. So, of course, the, that rural piece is we're not getting the things that we need. Although we have this huge mon monumental budget, I just worry about sustainability. And so the thing for me and, and, and again, with all my R toys, 
they feel the same. Uh, that, that mental health piece has to really be at the forefront of education, and I'm talking about pre-service teachers. You know, anytime I can talk to colleges about, uh, you know, what do they need to do better, what should we be, you know, preparing our new teachers with, is that they need to know these tools of helping kids, building those relationships, those positive safe spaces with those kids, so that when they come to school, they feel to okay to be their true authentic self so uh, you know if, if, if a student is struggling at home maybe for example in my district I have kids that are in drug houses so that when they feel comfortable enough to be at school and safe if they need to take a nap they can take a nap because they know it's safe to take a nap and so you know if, if they need extra you know food breakfast lunch a snack it's a safe space for them to ask for it whereas Kids who are not regulated don't have those tools. They might flip the desk or swear the F word or you, do, you know what I'm saying? So they're unregulated. So if we can get those supports and those systems in place where everybody is getting the same things that they need, the basics that, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to see some change. Yeah. Are you, as you're going around the state and you're visiting the art toys, are you seeing services in some districts that you guys don't have in the UP that you need and what types of services are you? Absolutely. Um, for example, when I went to uh, visit Kathy Lambries in her district, um, she she has like a, she has an on-site doctor's, you know, there it's housed there, and so they they have more of that comprehensive mel mental health and and health systems which we we don't have access to in, in, in rural areas. I mean, I'm sure there are rural areas down here that don't have that access e either. Um, she had a really amazing mentorship pro program for new teachers um, that was, um, you know, very structured. You know, those new teachers were feeling the support and the networking in the system and, you know, felt held uh, where we don't have that across the state. And so uh, I see inequity. And, and especially for me, like in the in the UP, sometimes, you know, there are things that we're doing great in the UP, like um, we we're just talking about low, um, you know, high numbers, 34. I mean, there were years I had 27 first graders, and that's a lot with no aid. Um, and, you know, it's a critical, it's a critical year. Um, but my current superintendent thinks low class numbers is a priority, and he worked very, very hard to lower those. And so this year I only had 21. Um, I lost a couple and I have about 19 now, but uh, kindergarten has 13 or 14 and, and, you know, it makes a tremendous difference. So those are things that, you know, we're doing great and um, that I, I, I think other districts could benefit from as well. And so as I'm using this role and I, the thing that I want to see is more equity across the board from, from the top of the state to the bottom of the state. And sometimes we get forgotten up there. And, and so I, I really, you know what I mean? I, I really feel like, um, for, I, and I, at the national level, I've, I've met up with a, a, a guy by the name of Ty White. He's from Arizona. He won um, Rural Teacher of the Year. And he started a podcast. And we are going to be um, talking about writing a book on rurality. And so I think it's really important that we don't, lose those small <coughs> schools. We talked about deserts, yeah. and I call them islands. We have lots of islands up there. We need to make sure that there's equity in, for all those kids that might be first-year college kids and, 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 and support them in the ways that other people are getting supported. I hope that answered the question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Um, when you, you use the term equity, and without going too far down the rabbit hole, um, <laughs> Just a definition of um, equity, equity to me um, doesn't mean exactly the same. But my, for me, for an example, we don't have CTE. Uh, we the, the transportation to get maybe a, a person from Carney Nato to their neighboring DSISD. There's it, all time is lost. There's no way for them to get it. And so there's no equity for them. If, they, if, if they're not going to go to college, they don't have any opportunity for CTE, what do they have? 
what 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 is their path? Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to, and I talked to our local DSISD, and he said, you know, because of the funding and the way that the lines are drawn, that it's, it's hard to get those islands uh, to be covered in any way that's beneficial because we don't have the buildings that can support inside of the buildings CTE programs, and we can't bust them there in a, in a timely fashion. So equity just means what, like, I went to the Wilson Talent Center. I mean, there's just no comparison. That that CTE program is out of this world. We have nothing like that in the OP, right. you know, and that's it, just not equitable. And yet, and yet, there are there are, there are deserts within Ingham County, right. a, as as well. Right. They're different deserts, and right. they have different different uh, genesis. Uh, we appreciate your leadership. Thank and you. just a just a, a note. So you won the Excellence in Education California Casualty Award. Is that right? Yep. So is it fair to say that that was more about excellence in education and less about California or casualties? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very good. It's insurance. That's like Mimic. It's an insurance company, um, and they support that. But uh, And I did not win $10,000. Kind of like an oxymoron, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a wonderful experience, and uh, they put on uh, quite a gala. And there was, there was flamingo dancing. I, I, there's, I have a video if you want to see it. And <laughs> it was amazing. And um, uh, um, Javier uh, Munez from Hamilton was there, and he sang. Wow. It was just, it was, mm. it was phenomenal. <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much. We're, we're, we'll have to talk afterwards. Yeah. Mm. Um, I have a video. Dr. Robinson is a, is a music teacher, so he, he may regale us with the Hamilton rendition. Listen, I loved it. <laughs> Next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. Uh, Marty Ackley, our Director of Public and Governmental Affairs, will lead the state and federal legislative update, um, at the end of which we will uh, consider the two resolutions that have been placed on the uh, board agenda. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Ms. Hanson, I walked by the White House one time. Oh. I was in it. I, right. <laughs> I, I took a picture. I took a picture by Michelle Obama. Wow. When I saw the snipers on the roof, I decided not to try oh, to yeah. scale the fence there. Yeah. I heard they frowned upon that. for you, Marty. heard they frowned upon, they frown that. upon that. Yeah, a little bit. Um, so I'm here to give you uh, some updates on legislation uh, moving through the uh, state legislature. The sinking fund bill, Senate Bill 63, uh, amending the revised school code to allow a sinking fund tax authorized on or after the bill's effective date to be used for purchase of real estate for school buildings, uh, security improvements, technology and transportation services that was signed into law by the governor. Um, so it's now Public Act 26. Uh, red flag bills. The legislature has passed the so-called red flag bills and they have been sent, it has been sent to the governor mm -hmm. for her consideration. The bill would allow for courts to consider extreme risk protection orders that would allow specified individuals to petition a court for an ERPO, extreme risk protection order, for another individual building on other common sense gun safety laws enacted uh, this legislative season uh, session. Um, but Senate Bill 83 is the main bill. There are others that are coming uh, to the governor. The legislature has also passed House Bill 4166 to repeal the duplicative A through F school accountability law. The bill will be sent to the governor for her consideration. The bill did not receive immediate effect, which means that the department will need to publish a final A through F report this year. Uh, the cursive writing bill uh, to allow MDE to develop or adopt a model program of instruction on cursive writing as a type of penmanship by August 1st, 2024. Um, the bill uh, would also encourage districts to incorporate that program. Uh, the House passed that bill 103 to 4 and is now in the Senate Education Committee. The House also passed the TAPS bill to provide a pupil um, an excused absence from public school for the purpose of sounding taps at a military honor funeral for a deceased veteran. The House passed that bill 103 to 5, and that also is now in the Senate Education Committee. The Senate passed the teacher and counselor reciprocity bills to allow teachers and counselors with three, three years of successful experience in another state to become certificated in Michigan. Um, the teacher reciprocity bill passed 37 to 1, and the counselor reciprocity bill passed 38 nothing. Both bills are in the House Education Committee where they had their first hearing this morning. Each bill did receive immediate effect in the Senate. 
Uh, the Senate had passed, has passed the first filter bills to require the installation of water, water filtration systems in schools and child care centers. Um, Senate Bill 88, the one for child care centers, passed 31 to 6. And Senate Bill 89 for schools passed 30 to 7. Both bills are now in the House Committee uh, of Natural Resources, Environment, Tourism, and Outdoor Recreation. Uh, we're also following a bill, um, Senate Bill 66, that would require MDE to work with experts on sexual assault and sexual harassment to develop age-appropriate informational material relating to sexual assault and harassment to make the material available to all schools that operate grades 6 through 12 and require school districts to disseminate the information material to each pupil in grades 6 through 12, as well as provide each student the contact information for the district's Title IX coordinator. Uh, the bill, that bill passed the Senate by a 37 to 1 vote. It is now in the House Committee on Criminal Justice. That's part of a larger bipartisan package of bills to create guidelines for health professionals performing certain procedures in an effort to prevent sexual assault under the guise of medical treatment. This all resolves from the um, Nasser case uh, several years ago. So these bills um, address that, and Senate Bill 66 would require MDE to work with um, other experts, including the Department of Health and Human Services and advocacy groups to develop age-appropriate informational materials related to sex assault and harassment. And finally, the budget um, is being developed on both the House and Senate with the expectation that they are being voted out of their full chambers this week. So that's my legislative report. And the legislative committee for the State Board's Legislative Committee meet, uh, met on April 26th. And I will hand it over to our chair, Dr. Pritchett. And we um, had a meeting, Marty and I did, during lunch. And um, we determined that what I would say at this point is ditto. <laughs> because um, I sit here and take notes while he brings us up to date. I appreciate um, uh, we we are um, have gratitude for the uh, way in which uh, the legislature has been very, very busy uh, in uh, very positive ways, uh, in particular um, getting rid of things like retention for um, our third graders, which the governor has signed, uh, and repeal the A to F, which uh, Mr. McMillan is right. We had long discussions about at this board table. So um, our next meeting will be May 25th at 1230. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yeah, word on the street was Mr. McMillan uh, was, uh, was trying to push for some uh, uh, yes votes for A through F repeal. That's not um, in the House. In, in both the uh, House and the I Senate. I, I, I heard you got some in the House. And, uh, props, to, uh, props to you in that uh, re regard. Thank you. Um, would, have been, would, have been, would have been nice to have pulled some, yeah. in, the, to, some in the Senate as, as well. I think sometimes people um, hang on to uh, their, their mistakes. Just to note that uh, the teacher reciprocity, council reciprocity, A through F, and red flag, uh, legislation pieces. They're all a part of our department legislative agenda, all moving forward. We appreciate that. And with respect to cursive legislation, it's clear uh, that the handwriting is on the wall. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're heading over to uh, Dr. Robinson. I for, can't follow uh, that. I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Now, please. I have a question. Can you um, update uh, on the Senate's incorporation of, I think, an opportunity index in their funding formula, which I assumed was in response to the School Finance Research Collaborative and their desire to move away from a straight per pupil funding and one that deals with additional funding for um, more uh, difficult to educate or more expensive to educate populations of students? Well, there are funding lines. In fact, the governor proposed them too, funding lines for certain populations of students. So there, there, there is a, that. There's a discussion about they're actually working on a revised formula okay. that would include an opportunity um, up, up, um, like a like a multiplier okay. that would 
um, fun districts that have higher proportions of students with special needs or English language learners, which is something that some of us have been advocating for since. Yeah, I'm, I've not been privy years. to those dis discussions. Any other questions or comments uh, from board members to Mr. Ackley? Going once, twice, thrice. Hearing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Ackley. Uh, we are now going to consider the uh, two resolutions that were put on the agenda this morning. If we could distribute those, let's take them. They're, they're already yeah. open. Very good. So um, we did not read the first one. So um, Dr. Pugh, if you would be kind enough to um, move the first one, we can get a second for it. And then in, in your discussion, perhaps you read it into the record. Um, and I don't know. I guess I would want to, um, should I make a motion to yes. supplement? No, you should you should make a motion to to move what was initially okay. uh, submitted. Um, we'll have a second for that. We'll get it on the okay. agenda, and then there can be an amendment associated therewith. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. Um, and so we will start with um, the resolution in support of Michigan's LGBTQ plus students, staff, and uh, GSA LGBTQ plus clubs. You're going to move it. I'm going to move it. Yes, okay. I, I move to um, that we um, adopt a resolution in support of Michigan's LGBTQ students, staff, GSA, and LGBTQ plus clubs. So gay, straight alliances and LGBTQ plus clubs. Very good. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Pugh, for discussion. Um, and we do have, um, so let me first start by saying um, this is an opportunity for us to further affirm uh, that the Michigan State Board of Education um, stands um, and promotes and uh, has spoken loudly and more clear around um, environments that are supportive um, and protective of all students and also um, recognizing um, dates that are already recognized on the calendar and that we support school districts in, um, in acknowledging those, those dates. Um, and also that we um, support all laws and regulations that prohibit, prohibit bullying and harassment against all persons. Um, and that we support uh, certified Michigan employees uh, to have the academic freedom to discuss um, this resolution, as well as students to be made aware um, that there are counselors uh, that are available to them, them to discuss subjects contained within uh, the resolution. And that is the basis for this resolution. So that's the, the resolution before us. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, any additional discussion by, uh, by board members? Ms. Snyder. I'm going to move to make uh, a few amendments. Mitchell, will you pass them around? I'll wait to read them until you get them. Do you want one? Please, if I could. Or I can make a copy, whichever Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. So on the front page, I I numbered the I numbered the paragraphs uh, 
So number seven at the very bottom. Are you making a motion? I'll support. Yes, uh, okay. I move to make this <laughs> I'll support. amendment. Thank you. Whereas the U.S. Department of Education supported the original spirit and intent of Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 to be interpreted as providing for the constitutional right to full and equal access to public education, including sports and extracurricular activities for biological young girls and women, and this body declares that biological women still have a right to equal access to all aspects of public education. So that would strike paragraph 7 and replace with that. So, whereas in a landmark opinion, is that what you're saying? <coughs> whereas the U.S. Department of Education in a notice of interpretation. Oh, okay. So we would strike that and replace it with what I just read. The next paragraph, we would strike the last whereas. Ask me a question. Are, are you moving these three together, which is fine? I am fine. moving these three Beautiful. together, yes. Okay, thank you. So on the second page, the last whereas states, um, whereas educational personnel are often the primary sources of support, resources, and information to assist and support students in student learning, which includes their social and emotional health. I would move to strike that and insert it with, whereas Michigan's constitution Michigan compiled law and natural law all define parents as the primary source of support, resources, and information in assisting students in their learning and academic achievement, which includes their social, emotional, and spiritual health. And then the final paragraph to amend would be 17, which is on the third page at the top. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Michigan State Board of Education prohibits discrimination against all persons, whether student, family caregiver of a student, or school employee on the basis of actual or perceived sexual orientation. So before we identify a number of protected classes, we also include the original protected class of Title IX, and that is biological women. So that is my motion to those three paragraphs. Just a point of clarification. So the, the, I understand what you're doing with the first two. Tell me about the third of the three. It, it, it substitutes for? It does not substitute for. Okay. It adds after or school employee on the basis of biological gender and then continues with the original What's the resolution. first of the, yes. the results? Yes. I got you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a we have a, a motion, three part uh, amendment by uh, Ms. Snyder. We have, uh, I believe, a second from Mr. McMillan. Uh, Ms. Snyder, back to you for any discussion associated therewith. I think that biological gender is something that we have to consider when we interpret Title IX and what it looks like to afford all students equal public access to education. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, anything else on uh, uh, Ms. Snyder's reflection on these this three-part amendment? Hearing and seeing none, uh, if we could do a roll call vote on Ms. Snyder's amendment. Bullock? No. Lipton? No. Michelle? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pew? No. Robinson? No. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? No. Motion fails. Okay, thank you very much. So, so that was um, that was a vote on the amendment. Yes, Mr. McMillan. I have uh, an amendment. Um, after the last, be it further resolved, paragraph insert, be it further resolved, this stating scientific facts like no male-born person will ever ovulate is not considered bullying nor harassment. So moved. No support. Sorry, Support. support. I'll, t I'll send these to that. Okay, one. thank you. I mean, I, I, it's a pretty simple sentence. I don't know that they need this, but no, I'd like to read it again. <laughs> well, can I have discussion? But uh, yes, and um, just yes, but just a, a a note. We need it for the for the minutes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. so this is important. We okay. appreciate the writing yeah. that, that people have given us. Thank you. Please. So you know the resolution is presented. Uh, uh, by uh, the president, uh, you know, certainly talks about harassment and bullying. 
the, the issue becomes what is harassment and bullying. And so I wanted to make it clear that simply stating scientific facts, and there's others, mm -hmm. uh, Nikki might mention as well, but um, this sometimes is considered harassment or bullying. And therefore, they're trying to silence the facts that maybe some people don't necessarily like to hear, but nonetheless, they're scientific facts. And so before we, and, and I've seen it plenty of times where, uh, you know, you, they try to say, uh, you know, that this hurt, this is hurtful, but it's a fact. And so, you know, I mean, what is bullying? What is harassment? Um, certainly, if you say it 20 times and yell it at, yell it in their face, you know, that may constitute harassment or bullying. But I'm just talking about the mere simple stating of, of scientific facts, like no male person, no, no male born person will ever ovulate, is not considered bullying or nor harassment. Uh, so that's. I think that that's important to kind of uh, clarify what this resolution is talking about when it says harassment or bullying. Okay, thank you very much. So we have, yes, please. I would just add on to that. We There are stories nationwide that you know are out there that don't protect students in their, um, their worldview, if you will, or their perspective. So there's a story of an eighth grade boy that wore a shirt that said there are only two genders and the school took him down to the office and told him that he wasn't making other people feel safe by the shirt that he was wearing. And it was a, an entire issue. He presented before his local school board. Um, and again, when these people present before their local school board, they get called terrorists. There's just a sense of there is not true diversity in um, values and thoughts uh, and opinions and evidence. Um, so when you, when you consider what Tom is putting forth, that's, this is what he's saying. Uh, will we come to a time and a place where people cannot truly debate um, at these young ages uh, because it's considered bullying? I, mean, I, think, I think we need to consider what that looks like before we pass a resolution like this. Okay, very good. So, so we have uh, uh, Mr. McMillan's amendment. Uh, Ms. Snyder, I believe, seconded the amendment. We've had some discussion. Is there any additional discussion? Hearing and seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Evans. Bullock? No. Lifton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Robinson? No. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? No. Motion fails. Mr. Chairman? Please. Uh, another amendment uh, after the last be it further resolved paragraph insert be it further resolved that students with a penis should not compete in girls sports. I uh, do this because uh, you know this the first resolved of this um, sorry of this uh, resolution talks about prohibiting discrimination uh, based on perceived sexual orientation, gender identity. I want to make it clear, I hope that this board would, that students with a penis should not be competing with girls. There is an assault in some areas, hopefully it's not the, the intent of this board, to really attack women and women's sports, to attack, uh, you know, to really uh, make it so that there is an unlevel playing field, that uh, really women who have trained their whole lives or girls who are trying to train and, and become excellent uh, simply miss out because a uh, person with a student with a penis uh, claims that they are a girl and uh, wins in swimming or some uh, sports. So I just want to make it clear that this is a, a, a pro-woman, pro-girl board and that we make it clear uh, um, what we feel uh, Regarding this this matter, That's okay. So we have a uh, we have a motion from um, oh yeah here yeah from Mr. Okay. McMillan. You have a second. We have a second from Ms. Snyder. Thank you so much. Any additional uh, discussion? Yes. Please. It's not just the male anatomy that is important. It's the hormones. It's the entire development of biological males that makes a difference in this particular amendment to the foundation of the resolution. Um, males have and always will have a physical advantage over biological females, which is why equal access to public education, sports and extracurricular included, was ever uh, what Title IX came to provide equal rights to women for. So I mean, I'm, 
women's rights still matter, and they always will. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, other board members? Hearing and seeing none. Uh, Ms. Evans, please, a roll call vote. Bullock? No. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Robinson? No. Snyder? Yes. Silly? No. Motion fails. Mr. Chairman, Thank you I, have very a, much. I have another amendment, please. Yes. Uh, yes. Amendment number four, Af after the last be it further resolved, paragraph insert, be it further resolved, that it should be unlawful for government funds to be paid to doctors who encourage students to undergo transition treatment without parental consent. Is that support? Second. <laughs> so this, oh, if I may speak please, to yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, um, I think this is a very low bar. Um, I think that uh, at the very least, um, and certainly, you know, this resolution is talking about, uh, you know, again, we need to define what exactly we're saying here in these resolutions or in this resolution. And I think to make it clear that what we're saying is that government funds should not be going to doctors who are performing or, or, or encouraging uh, transition treatment without parental consent. Um, I would hope that uh, what happened, what um, uh, Board Member Snyder had mentioned in another state um, had happened, and I know, you know it, that it shouldn't happen here. I would hope that this board would, within this resolution, certainly want to affirm that, at the very least, parental consent should be given before government funds are paid to doctors to encourage students to undergo transition treatment. Okay, so we have a we have a motion, we have a second, we've had the beginning of discussion. Any other discussion on this amendment of Mr. McMillan's? Yes. Please. This is an extremely important part of what it looks like to pause and consider the ramifications of the resolution that we have before us. I personally have taken care of people in my practice as a nurse that have had a double mastectomy before their childbearing years because of the adults in their life that encouraged them to make these decisions. When you guys put this resolution forth, and you send it out to local public school districts to adopt policies that encourage children to make adult decisions before they have developed, before they have grown, before they are able to understand the impact of their decisions. You are not the ones on the other side of that and seeing the outcome. And I can tell you, when you help a woman who is a trans male, who can still have a baby because she has a uterus, but cannot breastfeed, and did not know or understand that before she removed them, you undoubtedly influenced that decision. There is far more in this resolution than you are willing to consider. And it is bizarre and inappropriate. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Snyder, Dr. Pugh. What I find um, bizarre and inappropriate is that you all are putting things or putting things into the atmosphere that are not in this resolution. This resolution is about harassment, it's about bullying, which no child uh, should be bullied, no educator should be bullied. That is what this is about. This is about making sure that all students, all educators uh, have safe spaces uh, when they go to a school environment. The things that you are talking about are nowhere listed in this resolution. And for you all to be putting that out in the atmosphere is irresponsible and bizarre. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. Uh, Ms. I will Snyder rebut back, that. Please. It is not. This, this resolution absolutely sets the foundation for the culture war that you are the author of. The truth is when you say reaffirm legal protections, expand coverage to gender identity, when we have a Michigan Department of Education that is encouraging teachers and schools to withhold information about pronouns, about gender identity from parents, 
when we have an age of consent and the concept of health clinics on the horizon in schools, and we act like this resolution is not essentially the, the fortress, the protection for what that looks like moving forward, no, we're not going to sit here and pretend like that isn't the case. When schools and public education think they are responsible for the privacy of students to make these decisions at the age of consent, which is 14 in the state of Michigan, not parents, we are not going to sit here and pretend that the first step of taking hormones and then eventually surgical transition at a young age before they've even had an opportunity to consider what those body parts will do for them later on or whether or not they want them for that purpose. No. We are not going to put this forth and act like, nope, sorry, this is not what that's about. Uh-uh. That's not, we're, we're not going to look the other way right here, right now. This silence right here is absolutely not acceptable. We are leaders. We have to consider the impact of our decisions. This is not an opportunity to politicize such a reality. It's not okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Snyder. Ms. Tilly. We are leaders, and we have a responsibility, responsibility to protect those that have been harassed, that have been bullied. Um, you know, we, as human beings, we put animals on um, an endangered species, species list to protect them because they are, you know, for those species, they are on the brink of extinction. We want to make sure that we protect them um, and keep them safe. We have to keep our, our children safe, all of them. And it's, it just appalls me that, you know, we want to take up for, it's almost to me like we're taking up for people that don't need to be ta taken up for the people that have been harassed and bullied, we want to ignore them. We don't want to give them a voice. We're supposed to stand up for them. We're not saying, um, go have a medical procedure. That's not what this is. This is not what we're talking about. We're not reinforcing or forcing an issue of a medical procedure for a child. We're talking about those students having rights in schools, that they have the right to be educated, that they have a right to be in a safe space, that they have a right to um, communicate how they feel and, and what they're thinking. That, that's, that's what we're talking about in this resolution. Anything beyond that has nothing to do with what we're talking about and what we're focused on. We're not the ones politicizing anything. This, this has, this, you know, Tom mentioned about policies. We're supposed to set policies and standards, although this is a resolution, not a policy. But we're supposed to set policies and standards here, and I would love to focus on that more than the distractions that we get with politics. So right now, we want to focus on the safety of our students, and particularly this population of students who needs it. Anything else beyond that is not a part of our conversation. That is you two. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Uh, Dr. Pugh, Ms. Snyder. I just want to make note, um, because I think it's laughable, and, and at the same time, I'm, I'm appalled at the fact that it has been stated that I am the author of Culture Wars. And um, to my, to board member Tilly's uh, point, and as I started, we are simply trying to make sure that we protect our children uh, who we are responsible for. Uh, when we look at suicide rates, when we look at me mental health, social emotional supports, we know we have to do all that we can to make sure that our students are, are equally supported in schools. I am not the author of Culture Wars in doing so. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Ms. Snyder, to you. Just one last rebuttal, and then I will leave it where it's at. Um, 
You say this is about bullying. You say it's about harassment. And yet this has already become come before this table in 2018 when Lupe Ramos Montini put forth a resolution about bullying, about harassment, of which I voted yes on because I have family members and friends that have needed to be protected. And I am one of those people who will always protect the differentiation that we should be celebrating. However, this resolution goes way too far. That is not what this is. And if it is what this is, then we wouldn't need to repeat what we've already signed on for and is already out there for local public school districts to utilize as guidance. I'll let the call. So we have a uh, hold on one second. Thank, thank you, Ms. Snyder, for 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 that. If you'd like to call the um, call the question just, on the amendment, can I just add, add that? I mean, I since I authored this amendment, I'd like to just also wrap it up real quick. That it does. I mean, the last whereas educational personnel are often the primary sources of support, resources, and information to assist and support students in student learning, which includes their social and emotional learning, so uh, or emotional health. I mean, you know, this does, I, I understand, and, and Ms. Snyder tried to replace this and talk about parental authority, but it, that was rejected. I understand that, that you know, maybe some on, at this table don't know what, they, the, what they're moving, what this resolution actually says. Almost the exact same was uh, passed in Rochester by the left as well. Um, I think it's coming from some, you know, progressive uh, organization and just kind of pushing this stuff out. So I understand that you might understand not know what it is in this. It, you may think it just has to do with bullying and discrimination, but it has a lot more than to, that to do with it. It is an agenda. It is a uh, cultural agenda that the left is pushing hard, and um, it doesn't like it when there's pushback. So I understand that, but uh, we're not going to go down this road of assaulting and, and harming women and uh, women's rights uh, and also assaulting um, children and telling them the mo that truth, there is no truth, that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. And uh, it's just, it's uh, very sad. And we're going to, we're going to try to inject some reason into this discussion as much as we can. We have been elected to do that. So I would certainly hope that this small, this, you know, they, somebody said, one, you know, the, the person who said, the Democrat who said, I'm not talking about sending people to uh, medical procedures. Well, then simply show that you aren't talking about that by, vote, by voting yes. Because a no vote on or this amendment cl clearly says that um, you have no problem without parental consent, uh, state fund or government funds going to doctors to encourage students to undergo transition treatment. <clears throat> Member Tilly, you know who I am. Hold on, hold on one second. Um, we have a, um, um, Dr. Pugh, you had a motion to, um, call, the to call the question. Um, if you would like to substitute yeah. that for um, a comment, and then we'll, we'll have a comment from Ms. Tilly, and then, we will, then we'll vote on the amendment, please. Um, though my fellow board member, uh, just tried very in a nice voice insult me. I, I will call the vote. <laughs> very, very good. So to call the vote is to call a vote on the vote. So would you 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 want you want to get a vote? Is is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Rather than simply a, a vote on the vote. Okay, uh, Ms. Well, Kelly, do, are, are you are you okay for the the vote? Do you need another comment on this particular amendment? It's, it's you know who I am. Be respectful, Board Member Tilly. He, yes. Very good. He, he did throw okay. out two insults, but uh, I, I got understood. It. And and I, and I'm fine with you rebutting. Ignorance. And we yeah. can we can we can well, we can we can speak on the fourth amendment uh, of this, or we can get to your amendments on it. Yes, but we're we're understood. voting on the amendment, right? Fair enough. On the proposed amendment. So so we're um, this is a vote on Mr. Uh, McMillan's um, third amendment, fourth amendment in total, uh, please. Bullock. No. Lipton. No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Robinson? No. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? No. Motion fails. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. One more. Please. Um, be, uh, after the last be it further resolved paragraph insert, be it further resolved that a student's parents are responsible for raising a student. 
Second. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. We're distributing the, uh, the slips of paper. Uh, Mr. McMillan, to you to yeah, uh, speak I, to this. You know, I, I, if this might not have been needed if uh, Ms. Snyder's First Amendment had been accepted. I just do not see, and uh, anywhere in the resolution, really the interest uh, in deferring to parents or recognizing that parents are the ones that are supposed to be raising a child. And unfortunately, uh, this idea has been accepted for millennia, but under the radical left, uh, who are forcing kind of a allegiance votes uh, around the country, including here today, uh, to some really bizarre things. It really does amount to uh, the school and the government is to replace the parent. Now, hopefully that's not the case here. And therefore, I would like to give the opportunity for uh, everybody here to show that that they uh, do not intend, because it's not listed here. There's, I don't even know if parent is even mentioned in this. It's certainly, uh, and, and we know, uh, as Ms. Snyder said, that the department is actively instructing teachers how to deceive parents. Uh, it's still on their website. And how to uh, make sure that parents don't know uh, that the children um, you know, are asking to be referred to as somebody else or uh, you know, with Pro Proposition 3, there's all kind of other possibilities um, that children no longer, the parents might not need to be told about transition uh, uh, therapy uh, being directed and, and, and pushed by uh, government and by the government schools. Uh, so this resolution, this part, this amendment would simply say that, okay, all this resolution you don't mention parents, really. There's really, uh, you know, but we do, in fact, want acknowledge that a student's parents are responsible for raising the student. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. We've got the beginning of discussion. Any other discussion? Uh, Dr. Pugh. Um, loud and clear. We know that parents are responsible for raising children. We don't put that in any other resolution. Why would we put it here? Um, I will vote this down too. I don't know if you have any more talking points to get out, but that one will be voted down too. Okay, so um, Ms. Snyder. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. If that were the case, and if a Michigan Department of Education is loud and clear about parents having that right and responsibility, they would not put out teacher training videos that suggest, and I should say it suggests, it was outright, if you watch these teacher training videos, that it is a school or a teacher outing a student's gender identity or sexual orientation to share the information with the parents of what's going on in school. Again, that's an incredibly false assumption, the idea that the government or the schools have the responsibility or right to affirm the identity of students or protect their, their privacy. That is not the role of the government. It's not the role of schools. It's the role and responsibility, and it's codified in law. It's in our Constitution. It's natural law that parents guide and direct the identity of children during their childhood and they protect their privacy, not the government. And it's just such a basic thing to, it's such a basic shared value that we could come to the table on and agree on. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Anyone else? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote on Mr. McMillan's Fourth Amendment, please. Bullock? No. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Robinson? No. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? No. Motion fails. Thank you very much. Um, any other um, amendments associated with this uh, base resolution that is before the board today? Um, you want to um, put yours out as friendly amendments? Sure. Okay. Uh, because mine are mostly syntax. Um, if you want to pass that out and Whatever that word is. Is it syntax? S I N T A X? No. The other one. Okay. 
Who is going to um, Who is going to walk us through these? I I can if you want me to. Um, again, these these I shared with Pam. Um, only for, excuse us for one second. Yeah. Let's get let's get our let's oh, get our okay. papers together. Let's make sure everybody has them in front of them. So. We can go. I'll, just, I'll share. Okay. Um, these are just moving around a couple of things um, and rewording some things. So. Um, and I made it bigger because um, my eyes needed it bigger. So on page two, uh, you'll see uh, all in red, it begins, whereas in a landmark opinion, Boxstock versus Clayton County. I moved that up because this is the introduction of this particular lawsuit because it's referred to then in the next bullet or the next whereas. So I just thought for flow it should be introduced first. So that I had just moved that up. So that's why it's all in red. And I put in parens at the end of that, move this for linear succession of dates. It would need a change in its um, footnote number. Uh, page three, um, again, um, I spelled out Gay Straight Alliances. Um, the next whereas, again, syntax, I just, you know, um, changed the wording of that particular sentence. The next one, again, just took out a word uh, into page four. Um, again, some changes in just some wording in the sentence. Um, and the first now, therefore, be it resolved, uh, State Board of Education supports all laws, both federal and state that prohibit discrimination, so I, I changed that a little bit. Uh, next one, be it further resolved, Michigan State Board of Education supports all laws and regulations, both federal and state, that prohibit bullying and harassment. Um, the next page, when we get down to the, uh, be it further resolved on the date, instead of designate, I change that to recognize, that the State Board of Education will recognize. Uh, because I wasn't um, clear whether every one of those dates were recognized dates at this point. Um, and then, again, just did some some changing and some words in some that last control. one. Some grammar control. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. That's mostly what it is. So. Um, and I accept these all as friendly amendments. Okay, so, so we have a base motion before us that was introduced by Dr. Pugh, that was seconded by Dr. Robinson. We have a friendly amendment there too, um, which is before the board uh, from Dr. Pritchett, which has been accepted by Dr. Pugh. Um, any discussion associated with the amended resolution, which is before the State Board, please. So you're saying this is there is no other uh, amendments. This is it. This this is where it is at this moment. Oh, okay. Well, then I just want to talk before the final vote. Well, absolutely. Yeah. 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 But but we're, we are. Okay. We're, I'll, I'll wait until I don't yeah. know if there's any other. Well, this is this is the this is the resolution okay. as it stands. Okay. So so if you'd like to talk on it, I'm I'm fine with that. It's wide open for for people's reflections. All right. Well, I certainly will be voting uh, no. Uh, actually, the, the resolution has never been read. Is that right? It was going to be read, and then I, I don't think it was. Ever, it's ever been read. But so, so if if uh, we can certainly uh, read it as it was uh, amended in a friendly fashion. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, adjective, the adverb of friendly is. <laughs> Friendlyly. I believe I'm right. Is that right? I mean, I, we were going to defer it. It never was read. It was, yeah. it was not read. It is now amended in a friendly fashion. Um, so um, we could read the uh, amended in a friendly fashion resolution before the board if it, if it is uh, the board's druthers. The board also has it in front of the board. Um, mm -hmm. So um, And the board has been debating this resolution for uh, 45 minutes. Um, so um, it's not clear from a chair's perspective that it's needed to be read 
but if there's a, a board member who would like to do the honors, would you like to no. read it? Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, please. My question is: It's not a requirement that the resolutions be read. It is. It is. It is not. We've 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 often read resolutions. But it's not a requirement. Uh, it is not a requirement. Okay. No. Thank you. No. I just thought people that watching don't know what we're voting on. Yeah. I just thought. Well, I think oh, over the last 50 minutes, I think well, they, some of it. they figured might, it yeah. out. Yeah. It's not a requirement that. What's that? It's not a requirement of this body. It, it is not a requirement okay. of the of the body. No. Okay. It, pardon me? Yes, it will be posted with the meeting minutes, of course. Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, Dr. Pugh, do you? Um, I, you know, I've, I've already stated um, what this is about. Um, uh, we will definitely post it um, and make sure that people are able to uh, get the printed version and we'll be able to see that this is really about, again, making sure that we do everything that we can from this table, from this body, to make uh, children feel welcomed uh, in schools as well as, as their educators, um, and then making sure um, that there are, you know, that our LGBTQ plus uh, students um, are not erased, that they do feel like they belong. Um, and as I mentioned before, as we look uh, at the health of students, um, this is this type of support, this showing of support uh, is imperative uh, to that. And that is what this is about. You know, we talk about the higher rates of anxiety uh, and depression. Um, we talk about uh, dropout rates, higher rates of absenteeism and low post-secondary in school aspirations when children do not feel um, um, welcome and, and um, included. And so, again, that is what this is about. Um, many of the discussions that were had and that have been put out, um, the, it, it's not mentioned in here. And believe it or not, I can uh, comprehend what is in a resolution that I have put before the board. Um, and so I would just rather put it out um, versus reading it. Um, because the last time I ended up on a TikTok video. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Um, any, uh, any other reflections before we vote on the resolution as uh, amended in a friendly fashion by Dr. Pritchett? No. Please. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that uh, the amendments that we proposed uh, certainly were my reference that maybe Someone didn't know exactly what was in the resolution was because the amend they they stated the, the amendments were superfluous and not uh, directed at the resolution, whereas I made it clear that they were. So I I don't know I just thought I was giving I was trying to be gracious and say maybe they didn't understand uh, what was in it because it's clear that it, you know this is about bullying and harassment. Uh, I tried to define it. Um, you know. All we heard about the last couple of years was trust the science, and yet all I wanted to say was stating the scientific facts is not bullying and harassment, but that was rejected. Uh, so it's certainly uh, trust the science only when the science, uh, you know, is what we want it to be and what we want to hear. Uh, I tried to make it clear that when we're talking about discrimination based on perceived sexual orientation or gender identity, that what we weren't talking about was that students with a penis should not, you know, they shouldn't compete with in girls' sports. That that should be clear. Anybody who, uh, and, and believe me, uh, in the coming years, you're going to run into girls, uh, if this continues to evolve like it is, who will say, you know, I would have liked this sport, but, you know, boys got in and, and beat me, and I was unable to really... Uh, it wasn't fair, and, and, and it hurt, my, hurt me for the rest of my life as far as what I could have done, uh, my passion, and I hope you'll say, well, I had a part of that. So, you know, I'm part of why you're hurt, why, why girls in this state like you were harmed. Um, I had a chance to actually amend a resolution and make it clear I, I wanted to stand up for you and oppose this, uh, but, 
you know, that I, I didn't. And so I hope you'll take uh, responsibility. Uh, certainly, as we talk about the resolution about who is going to be giving direction and guidance, uh, I wanted to make sure that it's understood that doctors who encourage students to undergo transition treatment, I didn't even say surgery, the ones that encourage surgery should be thrown in jail, and I think that someday we will throw them in jail for this child abuse that they're imposing on these kids. But at, at the very least to say that these doctors who are doing it without parental authority, without any parental con uh, consent, uh, that it shouldn't happen. You know, that's something that is in the, that is a byproduct, that is a necessary uh, consequence of the resolution, um, and we were going to stand against that, but that was rejected. Um, and our attempts to put in parental authority was rejected, uh, and so I tried it again to make it just clear that that's what we were talking about when, when the resolution talks about who is helping and who is guiding and who is, that it should be the parents that we're deferring to, and that the department, again, is, is uh, encouraging and instructing teachers how to lie to deceive parents to make sure that they don't tell the parents that what their kids are going through and that they're uh, wanting a, a, a different gender. So um, we have tried. My only, you know, one of my solace is that there will be a day of judgment. You all will be held accountable for the harm that you are inflicting on the children of Michigan. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Bullock, please. But, Thank must, you, Mr. McMillan. Must be a new day. Uh, first, I'm not going to allow you to keep demonizing this resolution. The intent of it is to protect marginalized group of children, and that is what we're going to stick to. And stating scientific fact can still be cruel. Stating the obvious can be cruel. And so we are here as a person who is from a minority three times over stating fact and having a belief system is what people have. And if you believe that I have a tail, then I must have a tail. Uh, but for the, the individuals here who keep saying it's, it's almost like reverse psychology. You just keep saying the extreme opposite of what this is, that someone will actually believe that this is to inflict some type of political agenda when it's the political agenda being thrown about the table in a manner that is convoluting what the intention of this resolution is. And if it was that simple, we probably wouldn't be having that conversation. Since you simply want to change a word or two, the words matter, and the words that you intend to amend create a more demonizing resolution. We are not here to demonize these kids. We are here to protect them at all costs. No matter how minor the, the, the group, how small they are in a minority in this school system, we are here to protect them all. And so what we need to do is educate the normalized kids about what's really going on out here and have a, 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 a neutral, a more, a more coveted society. That's what we need to have. So, you know, we can disagree, but don't, 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 don't use words to demonize and make us any enemies about things that can be resolved or have a better understanding of to have a, in, in, for the greater good. That's all I want to say. And we're, we're, we're not ignorant. So keep saying we don't know what's in things. We can read. We can write. No, we can. Uh, we, some folks got letters in front of their names. So <laughs> we're going to knock that off, too. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. And Ms., some uh, of Ms. us Kelly. have letters behind our names with the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say American society has treated too many people like sec second-class citizens. Um, we're all human beings. We all, we all have the right to be treated equally. People don't have to look like you or think like you to be treated like a human being because they are and they deserve respect. And that is all we are asking for, that these children be treated with respect and humanity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Any other uh, reflections before we vote on the uh, the amendment as uh, offered by uh, Dr. Pritchett and accepted in a friendly fashion by Dr. Pugh? Dr. Pugh. Um, in the spirit of teacher um, appreciation week, I just want to uh, just raise up um, how um, special of a profession it is for teachers, educators to be able to um, protect all of our students and to be able to understand and to be able to be there for each and every one of our students. Um, and they value that. Um, they are not teaching our students uh, to lie. Um, I think that is a lie. And um, but but for them to be trained, supported, and making sure that they are protecting uh, children, um, I think uh, that is to be commended. And um, making sure that we're interpreting that the right way. Though we know that that's few and far between, we know that, um, and we've seen it, we've talked about it, where that has had to happen. Um, so that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And just a, uh, just a note, um, the department, the notion the department is encouraging and instructing educators to lie and withhold information from their parents is patently false. It's not accurate. We acknowledge that parents are first teachers. We also acknowledge that there are situations at home, um, though they are not necessarily the majority situation, they occur. And when they do, educators have to be very careful about what they share with parents for fear that they might inadvertently put children in harm's way. The department's training saves lives. That's not simply my opinion, although it is my opinion, but the proof is in the students and the staff who give testimony to it. You want me to show the video? You want me to show the video? <laughs> yeah, Where we don't get to just teachings? sit here and lie. Yeah, one I'd be, video. I'd, I'd, be, is... I'd, be, I'd be happy you, you want me to, to, to have the, the, the person who did the training No, I'll show come the video in. that you have on your website. Oh, I, I, I've seen the video. I've no, seen all of them. Maybe you haven't, because it's clear that they're showing how to change, go in the software and make sure that it doesn't, that you deceive parents when whatever's sent home. It doesn't say what the child is being uh, called at, at school, uh, how to do a teacher, parent, uh, teacher parent conference, that you make sure that you do it this way in the system so that you don't tell them what their kids want to be called and the pronouns they want to be used. It, it's clear. And the video is clear. I can sh I can bring it next meeting. We have a uh, a vote in front of us, which we are taking now. Uh, it is uh, associated with the friendly amendment of Dr. Yeah, Pritchett the to the um, to the uh, motion of Dr. Pugh. It's friendly. We don't vote on it. I'm she sorry? accepted it. Understood. Right, we're voting the, on it. Is, we're it voting is on the, the motion. It, we, we are voting on the motion as amended right. in a friendly fashion. Right. Thank you very much. Please. Mr. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. Millen? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? No. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Board. Um, we have a second motion from uh, Dr. Pugh. Dr. Pugh, to you. The next um, resolution that I would like to move. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I have to go. Okay. Sorry. Okay. The next resolution that I would like to move is on the time to care and fair wage. Um, and this is a um, draft resolution that pertains to um, earned sick time and raising the minimum wage. Um, there was <clears throat> an effort to um, increase the minimum wage as well as um, support uh, paid sick time. And we've kind of talked about it here at this table um, a few times, and we've um, said that we would bring it here for a vote in, in support. And 
basically it was going to be a petition item. The legislature um, adopted and amended, unfortunately, the language and um, so pushes back the time for the minimum wage increase. Um, and so this, um, if, and I can read it, I guess I should probably read this one. Um, whereas polls show that over 70% of Michigan voters support earned paid sick time and raising the minimum wage, whereas the average yearly inflation rate increases by 3.8% regardless of whether or not the minimum wage increases and has currently increased by 5%, whereas the minimum wage in Michigan is currently $10.10 .10 per hour. It is not a living wage. It does not adequately support a family and keeps workers in poverty. Whereas according to U University of Michigan's uh, Journal of Economics, even for a single adult with no children, there is no county in Michigan in which $10.10 is a sufficient living wage, whereas women and people of color are disproportionately affected, whereas in Michigan, 33.2% of workers make less than $12 an hour, 45.8% make less than $15 an hour, tipped workers in Michigan make $3.67, and many are laid off due to the pandemic have not been eligible for unemployment protections. Where Secretary of State Jocelyn Vincent aptly noted both the Michigan Constitution and the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution protect Michigan citizens' right to amend our laws, our state constitution through direct citizen petitions, where it is in 2018 time to care uh, and the Restaurant Opportunity Center of Michigan each filed proposal setting forth that workers would accrue one hour of paid sick time for every 30 hours work and to raise the Michigan minimum wage to $12 per hour. Uh, for all workers, including those making the sub-minimum tip wage, whereas if enacted as they were originally written and adopted into law, this legislation will help alleviate poverty and allow workers who are still who are ill to stay home, thus preventing the spread of infectious diseases such as COVID-19. Therefore, be it resolved that the Michigan State Board of Education supports the enacting of paid leave and increases of increase of minimum wage and preservation of direct democracy. Be it further resolved that the State Board of Education calls on the Michigan State Supreme Court to weigh in, educate this pertinent matter. Um, and so I move um, that we adopt this resolution. We have a motion. Do we have a second? The second by Dr. Robinson. Uh, Dr. Pugh, back to you at 404. I see the time. The pressure is on. <laughs> Um, again, uh, and Marty, you can help me maybe with, with some of this and because it is kind of convoluted, but basically, um, we are waiting for the Michigan State Supreme Court to weigh in. Um, this is not just an issue of paid sick time, um, as well as minimum wage. And we talked about the importance of that. We can talk about the importance of parents being able to take care of themselves. We can talk about the importance of parents being able to put food on the table um, and uh, making sure that they can pull their, uh, they, they can, uh, we know the statistics as it relates to economic, economically disadvantaged students and uh, academic outcomes as well. But this also, um, this adopt and amend could be applied to any petition that goes uh, in, that goes out that it could um, that the legislature could take uh, the will of the people and reinterpret it. And so I don't know if you want to speak any to that, Marty. Okay. So we will move move on, um, and I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair, because we only have a little bit of time. Okay, very good. So we have a motion. We have a second. Any other discussion associated with our uh, our president's motion, Mr. McMillan? I um, remember right after the uh, petition was adopted uh, or was put forward on the minimum wage or the uh, restaurant. That wouldn't allow uh, or that would require the increase in minimum wage for tip workers. I was at a big boy and uh, a manager or an owner was talking to a, a, a waitress and she I was a, a furious and she, she said, you know, you are not going to pay me and then I'm not going to, you know, get tips. I'm, you know, this is, and he said, well, the legislature's doing it. And she said, I'm, I'm not going to 
you know, they're not going to tip me if you if you're going to pay me like that. And and uh, so she was furious. She said, "I'm leaving. I'm quitting." Uh, I think that it's uh, going to have a lot of uh, repercussions that uh, you know that are going to be surprising out there. Uh, and also, this idea that if enacted uh, as they were originally written and adopted will help alleviate poverty. Uh, anybody with a basic knowledge of economics knows that minimum wage harms the poor and the un, uh, the unskilled. They it raises the bar where they're no longer they no longer get a job. Uh, they, you know, I mean that's that's kind of basic economics 101. Now it does throw them on welfare or forces them to stay on welfare, which I know some want that to happen. They prefer uh, the people to be dependent on the government. But it does harm their future. Um, it's just kind of basic. Um, but it doesn't sound good. It's not a sound bite. So, you know, people keep pushing it. I mean, I don't know what the what the minimum wage is going to be, but why shouldn't it be? If this is such a great solution, make it forty dollars. Make it a hundred. Why? Why is it only going to be fifteen? I mean, because it's just uh, it doesn't. It, it's it's something that is done to, to for feel good, but it's not economics. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. McMillan, uh, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Pugh. I was just going to say that I forget. Uh, Tiffany helped me to author this, so I just wanted to make sure. Okay, she thank you very much, Ms. Tiller. Thank you, just uh, Dr. Robinson. Second, Mr. McMillan's uh, recommendation for a forty dollar <laughs> per hour minimum. I was trying to show how ridiculous it is. I think it's a good idea. Is, is that a is that a friendly amendment, or do we need a vote on that? Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pugh. Thank you, Ms. Tilley. Um, other reflections? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? I have to leave. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? And Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, we're at comments uh, by State Board of Education members. Uh, are there board members who would like to offer comments, please, Mr. McMillan? Mr. Bullock, take care. Yeah. Um, PowerPoints that we get, are they ever posted online? Yeah. I, I've, I've looked at past agendas, and I don't see them linked. Um, I was hoping that, you know, maybe we could post them. They are, they are linked to the meeting minutes, I believe. Oh, are they? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank yeah. you. They're embedded right into oh, okay. the script. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and my friend, oh, he's gone, John Love, uh, he has been a fighter of corporate welfare. And I, he was, when I was in the legislature, he was there talking about how, you know, these policies harm uh, students and schools and take millions and tens of millions and gives them to big corporations. And it just, it surprises me that the left continues to support uh, and push for, uh, you know, giving money to the wealthy and taking it away from schools. But... That he is, in fact, very true. Um, and sometimes those gov those businesses will say, well, if you don't give it to me, we're going to leave. But it, that, that's just a threat that they make. Uh, those that have called them on it, actually, they end up staying. Uh, and then finally, I, the idea of uh, passing policies, I hope that, you know, it, there was some contention, maybe a little bit today, uh, from time to time. But And uh, I do think that we could probably come together on some areas of policies and maybe pass them. I would encourage us all to ask our constituents and to hear hear them more about what the struggles they have with MDE. Uh, certainly, if those struggles are based on law, federal or state, then it's not really something we can deal with. But a lot of what they may be struggling with is uh, how MDE is interpreting or uh, rolling out or implementing uh, laws. And uh, and so I, you know, those are things that. We can uh, have hearings and uh, perhaps uh, pass policies and say, I know you're doing it this way. We don't like it. That's not the way we want it done. Now, you know, it, you know we're not going to do that willy-nilly, but there could come times uh, that, uh, that that is the case. Maybe it'll be done without having to do a policy, but maybe it's good. I mean, this board, uh, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, a policy, as we heard, stays. And so maybe it's good, even if they're doing something, that we want to make sure they're doing it in the future, that we pass a policy. Or it doesn't mean they can't rescind it, but uh, at least there'll be discussion about it. So I don't know. I, I would encourage us to maybe think about and look at, um, at, 
this new newfound, or maybe some of you knew more about it, but the idea of what we rescinded, maybe we should be passing policies. It seems like it's something that this body should be doing, mm -hmm. or at least debating them. I, I would hope to bring some ideas to the board. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Other, uh, other reflections by board members? Please, Ms. Tilly. Um, the minimum wage has gone up my whole life since I can remember. Um, inflation continues to go up. If we did not have a minimum wage in this country, unfortunately, we would go back to servitude um, because a lot of people would take advantage of there not being a minimum wage and just pay workers whatever they wanted to. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of good people out there that are hard workers that want to work, want to provide for themselves and their families, and um, are not being provided a living wage. And so there are many workers, parents, mothers that are working two jobs to provide for their children um, and still can't make ends meet. There are people that are working that stay in homeless shelters. And if you visit some of the homeless, homeless shelters, and maybe you have, I've visited homeless shelters and spoken with people who are working. So there is a necessity to raise the wage. Um, the years that they don't raise it, inflation continues to rise. Um, it did rise 3.8% every year, basically. But um, this last year, it's risen 5%. So it, the necessity has increased even more so. Um, also wanted to talk about, you know, we had some great presentations in the morning addressing the teacher shortage. And I just want to applaud the work that's being done, um, the Grow Your Own programs, and specifically with the students. Um, we definitely need to see more of those programs, get them excited about teaching. Um, like some of them said, some of it was for some of them and, and for some of them, it wasn't for them. But they get a chance to see the other side of what their teachers experience. And they get to see the joys of working with children and helping them to learn. So um, that is a very important program and also I want to applaud um, with these programs the support staff that are be given the opportunities, being given the opportunities to become teachers. Um, when I worked as support staff, I have worked as an ECE teacher. I have done work as a parapro. I have done work as a substitute teacher. And um, I was well respected and supported and mentored in most of the schools that I, I was in. Um, unfortunately, I felt that support staff in education period has not always been respected. Um, it's more so like the little person type of position. So I, I think this is awesome to um, really realize how important our support staff is and how they can be nurtured and give even more to the students than they already do. And um, if if I had big, been given the opportunity, I may not have gone to get an MBA. I may have gone to to become a teacher um, if if these opportunities were there. So these are some really great opportunities for people. And lastly, I want to um, talk about a personal personal thing, um, which most of you know that I talked about. Um, my friend, um, a very close friend of mine, an in-law was murdered last week, um, unfortunately. And going back to the mental health crisis that we have, the person that murdered her is going through a mental health crisis. So 
definitely want more focus in this state. <laughs> um, we definitely need more focus with our youth as well because our young people grow into adults that are having mental health issues. So um, we really, and, and like our employee mentioned earlier, that really has to be a strong focus for us. We can go back and forth and debate all types of things, but we all need to come together on how we are going to be a better support and, and you know, for our schools in Michigan, for our students, for our parents and our families when it comes to mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Other, uh, other board members? Going once, twice, thrice. Future meetings are uh, May 16th, the work session uh, at Camp Tasmahita in Greenville, Michigan. June 13th and August 8th, regular meetings of the State Board, all beginning at 9.30. If there are any topics board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify Ms. Evans or me. Board, it's 417. Enjoy the gift of time. Thank you. We are adjourned.